My name is Nadia Manzari. I am a partner and lawyer at Shields and Shields, and I will be your master of ceremony for this afternoon, dedicated to the fun tech and turning the KYC challenge into a competitive advantage. Indeed, Luxembourg is forging a recognized fintech sector to go with its well-established status as fund distribution center. <clears throat> For my part, I started my career 20 years ago at the CSSF, where I was head of innovation when I came back to private practice three years ago. And when I'm looking back now, I'm just amazed. Amazed about the journey we all went through. E-money, mobile payments, fintech, distributed ledger technologies, just a few buzzwords, virtual currencies, virtual assets, crowdfunding, rec tech, and our fun tech. It has really been an amazing journey we have been through. And I remember how many, I don't remember how many times people told me, but it was quite often, it's not going to work, it's a bubble, but I can, and we can all confirm here in the room and all the people who joined remotely that it hasn't been a bubble. And few and many things worked and are still working and will develop further. We have set up a framework now for crowdfunding. We have frameworks, or we are working on frameworks for virtual currencies, virtual asset service providers, for <coughs> uh, AI-based financial products, and everything is moving on. So I'm really happy when I look back, when I, was pre when I prepared this intervention, it's really a positive point, I would say, and a positive evolution we have been through. And I'm convinced that we have done a lot of things, and we will do a lot of things, and there is still a lot to do. So that's why we immediately start now, and I stop talking, <laughs> with the first session of this afternoon. And we we're going to start this session with uh, Pascal Bouvier, co-founder and managing partner of Middle Game Ventures, a fintech VC fund that invests in early stage startups in Europe, in addition, he is an entrepreneur and managed high-growth startups and SMEs in financial services, enterprise software, and software services. Last but not least, he has more than 10 years of experience in fintech venture investment. So I ask you to welcome Pascal Bouvier, who is joining us for a presentation about a brave new world of digital assets. Does this work? Yes, it does. Hello, everyone. We're going to start again. Hello, everyone. All right. I have a pulse. I have a pulse, but you have a pulse, too. That's great. So, indeed, thank you, uh, Nadia. My name is Pascal Bouvier. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Metal Game Ventures, a fintech uh, uh, fund that invests in startups in, uh, in the European Union. Prior to that, uh, I ran uh, a couple of other funds. Prior to that, um, I was an entrepreneur, and I ran several businesses in enterprise software, software services, as well as a couple of our industries. And prior to that, I was a banker. Incidentally, the two banks that I worked for no longer exist, so I think that the bankers, uh, the round over, are very happy that I don't work for a bank anymore. Um, all right. Digital assets. So let me start with uh, setting the stage here. Uh, and give you a definition of what I think digital assets are. It's one of the main themes that uh, my fund invests in, so uh, I better have the right definition, right? Um, we believe that there is a, in some cases, evolution, and in other cases, revolution in the way uh, assets will be represented in the future, whether it's a near future, medium future, or in Horizon 3, long-term long future. And we have uh, coined that term and defined it, others have also, as the next frontier of assets being digital assets. What does that mean? That means that assets will be represented once they're issued in different ways that they're currently represented, mostly tokenized, mostly on distributed ledgers, whether they're private or whether they're uh, public, mostly with some cryptography. The cryptography helps uh, the asset to be secured, as well as to prove its validity or its state, as well as to prove that a person that has a key to that asset is indeed the owner of that asset. And mostly 
on top of all of these attributes with certain lines of code that will be embedded in that token that represents the asset and that will define certain actions once the asset is issued. Corporate governance, voting, uh, yield distribution, dividend distribution, and the likes. That is fundamentally different than what we have right now in the world of assets. Fundamentally different, right? Even though we may have assets that are deemed to be quote unquote digital, and they are in certain way digital, let's take uh, the uh, publicly traded share of uh, Apple, right? Traded on, I forgot if it's the uh, New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, I think it's the NASDAQ. Um, I mean, heck, that's a digital asset, right? It's traded most of the time, not 24 seven. Uh, it's completely dematerialized and uh, you can trade with brokers and with counterparties. Yet, there are many actions before you buy a, a stock. It's been issued, right? I mean, there, there might be reissuances of uh, Apple stock. And after you buy the stock, that are manual, that require counterparties after counterparties after counterparties. And the promise of uh, these digital assets, right, is that the value chain before issuance and after issuance will be re-architected in ways that lead to more automation more transparency, and less manual interaction on that particular asset. That's quite fundamental, that's quite different, and that pertains to a future in the capital markets industry and the asset management industry um, that is radically different than what we have now. And which is why um, we are heavily invested in this future and we're investing in, uh, in startups that are building the infrastructure of tomorrow's uh, assets, of tomorrow's uh, the digital assets, right? Um, who owns some uh, Bitcoin here? One person, two, three, four, oh, more than I thought. Who is thinking of buying some Bitcoin in the next 12 months? Don't be shy. Wait, it's those that already own Bitcoin. So but the others are like, either already owning but not wanting to tell me that they're owning? Is that, uh, is, is that correct? Who owns some Ethereum? Yeah, almost the, the same amount of people. Cool, very, very interesting. Um, I'll get back to why I asked this question a little later. All right. Oh. The problem with um, my age is that I have a bad memory, so I have to take notes. Uh, the problem with taking notes is I have a horrible handwriting and, and I have to take off my glasses. All right, so um, I have notes that I've uh, uh, jotted down like 30 minutes ago uh, to, to kind of like get you directionally in, uh, on the path that uh, I want you to take with me. The global collectibles, are, uh, collectibles market is 370 to 400 billion. The global art market is over 100 billion, probably 150 billion. The gaming market is a puny 50 billion. I suspect that's gonna grow quite uh, a lot over the, uh, the future. The global stock markets, total capitalization is 90 trillion. Goes up and down, last I checked, it was around 90 trillion. Broad money is 96 trillion. Don't ask me the definition of broad money, it's in another panel. Uh, global debt is 250 trillion. Global real estate is 280 trillion. The derivatives market uh, is anywhere between notional value, right? Uh, notional value is anywhere between 600 trillion and one quadrillion. Gold is 10 trillion, global market again. Um, I'm sure that I'm missing a couple of uh, uh, global markets here, but these are the main ones, right? Has anyone paid attention and, uh, and tabulated the, uh, uh, the, the, the aggregate sum? It's a boatload of dollars, that's a technical term. Um, and then last but not least, the uh, crypto market is a little over $2 trillion, half of that being Bitcoin. The other half, probably there's a power law, half of the other half is Ethereum, and then it goes to uh, other uh, crypto coins, uh, tokens and uh, cryptocurrencies. What do all of these markets have in common? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Globe? Yeah, they are global, yes. They have investors, yes. They're assets, they have assets, 
right? All of these markets, right, trade in assets. That boatload of money, right, represents assets, any type of assets. And it is my thesis, I'm destroying the, uh, 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 the microphone here, it is my thesis that all of these assets will be issued in a different way than they have been issued up to today. When I put it in this context, and I put dollars and cents, and I should have done euros, I guess, um, you know, that's that's a completely different paradigm, right? It's one thing to say, ah, hey, all assets are gonna be digital, they're gonna be code, they're gonna be on distributed ledger, and blah, blah. But when you go and you say, ah, oh, global real estate is 280 trillion? I'm not even uh, uh, showing you growth rates for like the next five, 10, 20 years, right? 280 trillion of real estate around the world, which I am telling you, at some point in the future, will be tokenized, will be represented by tokens on a distributed ledger, some of which, again, being uh, public and uh, others being uh, uh, private. That's arresting when you think about it, right? All assets in the world at some point in time will be digital assets, will be tokenized, and won't be sitting in a centralized database. What does it mean? Um, what are the implications, right? Um, there are many implications. There are implications for investors, and as much as there will be different and new asset classes, we're seeing the emergence of uh, crypto assets, crypto tokens, cryptocurrencies, whether they are fungible tokens, whether they are non-fungible tokens. So investors will have to get familiarized with different types of assets. They will also have to get familiarized with investing in assets that they understand, but with which they will interact in a completely different way. The way that these assets will be issued prior to issuance, right? That will occur in a different way. The legal profession will be impacted. All the other third parties, whether they're investment bankers, whether they're brokers, whether they're uh, compliance uh, uh, people, whether they're regulators, will have to think through what they want to do, how they should adapt, what they should allow from a legal and regulatory point of view in order for these assets to be issued. Once these assets are issued, people will interact with them, traders, brokers, buy side, sell side, in different ways than they have interacted with current assets. Venues, exchanges for trading, OTC, centralized exchanges, everything will be somewhat different. Sometimes at the margin, sometimes you know wholesale. I'm not stopping there. Data analytics will be different. Indexing, credit, rating, indices, given that the data comes from completely different data structures, which are distributed ledgers and not centralized databases, will have to be rethought and are actually currently being rethought as we speak by startups that are uh, uh, attacking these uh, issues, right? But it's not only that, right? Fund services, fund accounting, security services, all of that will have to be somewhat rethought which is somewhat important for a financial center such as uh, Luxembourg, I would, uh, uh, I would think. So in other words, starting with you know, uh, a simple prolegomenon, which is all assets will be digital, and I've defined what digital means for me, to there's a boatload of assets <laughs> through different markets, to the market structures of each of these uh, markets and asset classes will somewhat change, to um, we will be interacting with these things in completely different ways. Um, that's a lot to digest, right? And it's not going to happen overnight. Obviously, change does not happen overnight. It takes a long time, and then all of a sudden, it's done. So we're starting with the world of um, cryptocurrencies, and there's a lot of um, experimentation, right? There's a lot of tinkering. There's a lot of BS, pardon my French. Uh, and there's a lot of scams, and there's a lot of fraud. And that's always the case when you have a lot of innovation happening in a burst of time uh, for a very short period of time. We have exactly the same thing with the internet bubble. Um, I remember when I was investing uh, then, you had a lot of scams. You had a, you had a lot of uh, 
schemes that uh, didn't mean anything. And 90 to 95% of what happened during the internet bubble died over a, cert uh, over a short period of time. However, however, what remained and succeeded and grew is now ruling our lives, both on the retail side, consumer side, and the corporate uh, uh, business side, right? Tech giants, um, social media, all of these internet giants, e-commerce, um, were born at a time where there was a lot of innovation and 95% uh, died. I think what is happening in the cryptocurrencies markets, in decentralized finance, in how these types of assets that are deemed to be crypto because they are endogenous to a, a crypto protocol, right, is what we will borrow, we being the financial services industry, in the next two, five, 10, 15 years. And we'll completely change the financial services industry in let's say 15, 20 years. How long did it take for the internet bubble and the craziness uh, that happened at that time um, you know, to impact our lives meaningfully uh, at a point where we're like, you know, we don't even think about it, right? We have a mini computer in our hands. Um, we look at it every five, six minutes. For those that are a little more CD than, uh, than I am, every two minutes maybe. Um, uh, but we don't think about it, right? It's completely embedded in, uh, in what we do. We also don't think about money. Right? We have digital money in our bank accounts. That's from our salaries and our consulting fees and, and so on and so forth. But it's proto-digital money. It's really dumb digital money. We have notes and uh, we have coins. We don't think about that because we've been living with that for like so long that we don't you know, marvel at that paradigm that we have uh, and that we use on a daily basis. We look at the cryptocurrencies market and we say, you know, most of us, uh, this is crazy. You know, when, it, when is the police, when is the regulator going to come in and step in uh, and completely uh, shut down all of these things? Uh, they may at some point, but much like with the intended bubble and what happened, uh, usually, you know, the right innovation follows the uh, path of least resistant, uh, resistance and comes to um, wow us uh, in every part of our lives. And I think that's what's going to happen. That is what is going to happen uh, at one point in time. Again, for certain asset classes, fairly fast. For other asset classes, it might take 15, 20 years, right? For publicly traded equities, probably 15 years uh, or more. For the art market, for collectibles, for gaming, uh, it is happening as we speak. You have creators and the creator economy. There's, there's in, the, in, in the world right now around 50 million creators that are dubbed to be creators, right? That live off of what they build digitally and uh, virtually. These people, you know, uh, make a living already out of, uh, out of the digital world and out of issuing these types of assets digitally and tokenized. Uh, today, we have an explosion in uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, uh, different than fungible tokens, obviously. They represent one unique as asset. It's very easy to do so when that asset is endogenous and virtual to a uh, protocol. Um, and I think that all of the tinkering uh, with NFTs will bleed into the art market and the collectibles uh, market. So literally tomorrow, in six months, in a year, in two years, You'll have big industry giants like the Sotheby's uh, of the world. You'll have uh, recognized artists uh, that will issue their art uh, as NFTs, tokenized. Either that art is physical and it's represented as a token, or that art is uh, completely virtual and, uh, and digital. So forget about what you know about the art world and gaming and collectibles. It's going to be fully digital. There are people that are trying to make the gold market um, a, a, a digital crypto market, right, with representation of gold on the uh, uh, on, on a distributed ledger. I don't know if that's going to happen, but that type of tinkering is going to be applied to one asset class after uh, the other. There are certain startups that are working on tokenizing real estate. There are certain startups that are working on tokenizing debt. These types of assets are fairly easy to tokenize. Trying to figure out how you automate all the legal documentation is really the hard work. And indeed, there are right, points of friction 
that will make some of these assets to become digital, you know, longer than uh, the others. The legal sphere, the regulatory sphere, standardization, as well as the change in behaviors of investors, consumers, and users. Right? No, make no mistake, um, younger generations, right, invest at a higher clip in digital assets and cryptocurrencies and engage in gaming, in collectibles, in what I call metaverses, which is like immersed uh, experiences uh, of games and, and, and more than games, uh, they're already there. They already interact with these types of digital assets. For them, uh, these are normal. It's a normal behavior. When these people will grow up and you know, take over uh, the economy and take over the wealth of their parents and their uh, grandparents, that will have a profound impact on the adoption of uh, these uh, uh, digital uh, assets. I have no idea how much time I have. Oh, all right, cool. Um, and so you better be prepared, right? Depending on uh, whether you're thinking about uh, your wealth and your retirement, depending on uh, whether you represent a certain um, profession, the legal profession, uh, securiza securization profession, uh, regu uh, the regulatory uh, profession, any other third parties and counterparties that interact with uh, assets, either before issuance, at issuance, or uh, post issuance. You have to start reading, boning up on uh, what is coming uh, down as a freight train, because you don't think that it's going to come down fast, but it's going to come down much faster than you think it will um, at some point. I have one minute and 15 seconds. Um, I'll take uh, questions from the audience. Who has questions? Or have I you know, put everyone to sleep? No one? No questions? Usually when there's no question, ah, there's a question. I usually cold call someone, so please speak out. How many um, fiat currencies are there in the world? I don't know the answer to that. I think there's many. There's more than 12. <laughs> there's probably more than 100. Uh, I would say that I have absolutely no clue how many cryptocurrencies there will be. Uh, I think that there's, there will be more than one. Uh, there might be a power law with one that rules them uh, uh, all and take like you know, 50, 60% of the uh, market capitalization, which is what we have right now with Bitcoin. Uh, but I would, I would assume that there will be many, many use cases uh, many more than we think there will be. There will be many uh, blockchains with their own uh, tokens, their own cryptocurrency for a very specific uh, purpose. And so I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, uh, we end up with like 100, 200 uh, or so uh, uh, out there. And I probably am uh, underestimating uh, that, uh, that number. One question here. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a good that, that's a good question. Um, I think there again, right? Well, first of all, crypto, different blockchains, layer ones as we call them, uh, which are like infrastructure, right? Some of the tokens, some of the uh, currencies will be for like speculation and holding and uh, investments as a reserve asset. Others will have an economic uh, use case, and uh, those that have an economic use case will be used to interact on certain uh, uh, businesses. Um, on, on, on certain um, economic environments and will be used to buy other uh, uh, assets, I think. So it's kind of like a, uh, on both sides. Do we have time for like another question or am I being cut off here? One more. One more. Yeah. Over there. Or you think it's still going to be uh, the digital currencies still 
Yeah. So again, to be clear, right? Um, in 15 or 20 years from now, everyone here or everyone that will be here will own a, a digital assets 100% on their uh, portfolio, right? That portion that is pure crypto, endogenous to, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a good asset allocator. I have never been in the asset management industry. Um, I think it's, uh, it's entirely uh, dependent on like macroeconomic uh, uh, trends and policies. If we have stable coins and the central banks issue stable coins and so on and so forth, I would say that the minimum would be, you know, uh, I, I would think the minimum would be 10% allocation uh, and a maximum might be 50, 60%. But uh, I'm, I'm making a fool out of myself for saying something that I'm not an expert in. So you, you have my, um, my, my, own, my own view at my own peril. She's nasty when, uh, <laughs> when you take her time. <laughs> Forty percent. Very good. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Pascal, for sharing your interesting overview on digital assets. So let's go forward now with our next presentation a discussion on how to foster innovation to contribute to the future of the financial sector. In this frame, we will be joined by two high-level experts on the financial market. Please welcome one of the experts I know quite well, and I had a lot of fun while I, while I was working with her for many years, Karen O'Sullivan, head of the Innovation, Payments, Market Infrastructures and Governance Department of the CSSF. What a long, long name. <laughs> she... She and her team are the privileged contact point at the CSSF to, en to enter the CSSF for the fintech industry. If you have questions, don't hesitate to call Karen and her team. Moreover, she represents the CSSF on a national and international level in various regions. She's joined today by Vishal Sachendran, Hello. Financial Services Regulatory Authority at Abu Dhabi, global market. He is responsible for the authorization of intermediaries such as fund managers, asset managers, crypto asset brokers and custodians into Abu Dhabi, global market. So please Karen, join us while we are connecting to Richard. As Nadia said, I'm um, head of the department in the CSSF, which is a very long and complicated name. And I will throw the compliment back in that I inherited from somebody else that name. Um, but I mean, the purposes of today, we're not going to go through all, all the different things that I need to look after. But I think what I'd like to do is focus on kind of the, the middle bit of the, of the department, which is really the innovation hub, and to really share the experiences that we've had so far within that team. Um, to, to give you an insight as to how we look to, to really foster innovation in our financial market. <laughs> Perhaps then I can start and kind of give you a little bit of an introduction or an oversight as to how we look at things and how we deal with things within the CSSF. So, I mean, financial innovation brings a lot of challenges to, to the financial sector, and it has done over the last couple of years. Um, and the financial sector as a whole has had to, to adapt to those challenges, and then us as regulator, naturally, we also had to adapt to the challenges. So going back a few years, we were following innovation, but we were following it in a within a within a larger context. So it was part of another job that several people were looking after. And then with all the, the developments within the industry and the importance that it was taking and the, the influence that it had over the financial sector as a whole, we decided it was probably a good idea to restructure ourselves. And there what the idea was was not so much to do new things per se, but it was really to dedicate a team. Um, full time to following innovation and to really see what actions and what what uh, initiatives we could take to foster innovation with the with the financial market as a whole. Um, we do have different approaches, and I think to a large extent they'll be the same approaches that others would have. So it's things like being technology neutral, uh, looking for a, a flexible or open regulatory uh, approach. Um, so technology neutral, meaning that we're, we're looking really at the service that's been provided or the product that's been used or sold, rather than looking at how that 
products has been uh, sold or how the service has been provided. So looking beyond the technology to really what's the underlying service or, or product and trying to see what's the most uh, appropriate regulation rules or requirements that we need to apply to that. Um, so we have a, a say a flexible regulatory approach. So here it's it's more looking at well how can we adapt or we can uh, interpret different things so that we can open the path to more and more innovation within the financial sector. So really what how we can look at regulation so that it's not hindering um, innovation and the the benefits that can be drawn from it, but really it's it's open. Having said that, there are rules in place and there are rules that need to be respected. So where that is the case, we do obviously make sure that those rules are being properly respected. And I think we look at those two approaches really to make sure that at the end we get on a good balance to a, uh, we say, a risk-based uh, supervisory approach. So really taking the, the advantages and minimizing to the extent possible the, the disadvantages and having that, that level playing field. Um, I think for, for us, is it working? I think... Vishal is connected now. Can you hear us? Hello. <laughs> so we had some connecting problem. That's technology too. <laughs> uh, so if you may, maybe, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, so perhaps I'll, I'll just continue and then I'll hand it over to you in a second if that's okay. Great. Um, so yeah, so they're the approaches that we have, which would be rather, I'd say rather standard probably across most regulators. But for me, what's really key to make it all work and to, to really foster the, the, the advantages or the benefits with the market is really open and transparent communication. And communication really is key. And I think one of the advantages of creating our innovation hub, which was roughly a year ago, was that by having a fully dedicated team who will say only look at all things innovation, and it, it really distanced them from the, the, the more traditional supervisory role, which means that when people are coming to present to us, be it a new service, be it a, a project, be it a regulatory issue, be it a, a stumbling block that they're trying to, to, to grapple with, in a way they can do it in, in, in relative confidence that we're not there as, a, as their direct regulator, writing down everything that doesn't work to come back the next week and and sanction them in one form or another. So it's really that, that, that open dialogue, which is key to the innovation hub. And it's really that, 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 that kind of underlying idea that made us or brought us to the, the decision that it was a good thing to separate it out. And I think, so the communication open dialogue, it's, it's very, very important. And we can see it functioning so far on different levels. So we have a lot of in, in interaction with, um, let's see, financial sector participants so in, in different roles, so be it regulated entities or currently regulated entities, be it entities that ultimately will look to be regulated or, or supervised, be it people who are looking or proposing to offer services to those companies, or even people with just, uh, we'll say, the start of, a, of an innovative project who'd like to come and kind of use this as a bit of a sounding board to see, well, where, where could this take me? Where this should where should this take me within the, the financial sector? And um, so far, it's been quite successful in that we've we've got a lot of interaction, not just with with people or companies active in Luxembourg, but also active around the globe, predominantly Europe, of course, but not solely in Europe. So that's kind of a, a good, uh, or at least for us, we we think that as a, a good feedback that that dialogue or the the reason behind that dialogue is 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 being understood. Um, and, and again, in those meetings, there is there is the flexibility, and I think it's it really gives us a we'll say win win type of uh, communication, whereby you have uh, the participants who are presenting their projects, presenting their ideas, um, and by presenting, we're able to give them an initial feedback, not a definitive feedback, of course, but an initial feedback as to perhaps the regulatory requirements the regulatory framework that they could fall into, that they should fall into, maybe some of the pitfalls that they could uh, look out for. But then on our end, it's very useful because we get upfront knowledge and, and discussion and understanding of what these changes could be or what the changes are, what they could be. And then it helps us to see or to, to program, if you like, how that may ultimately impact the financial sector and that the entities then that we're we're supervising. And with that upfront knowledge, it also helps us to be better prepared. So within the innovation hub, first of all, to, to orient the people in the right direction. But even further down the line and, and in our internal supervisory departments, it's useful information because the more we can understand or the more the supervisory departments can understand the product or how 
some piece of, of innovation is going to impact the financial services. Um, it, it means that we're more aware, we can be more aware up front of perhaps the different risks um, that, that need to be taken into account. And it means that in, in a way our, uh, our supervisory approach or position can be tailored before it's actually coming in and impacting um, our, the entities that we supervise. The communication that we have is not limited to people who have a project, who have an idea. Um, we work an awful lot with the, the industry groups. So again, on a local level or on a more international level. So there really is exchanging with different types of uh, um, industry groups, um, incubators, uh, financial innovation, we say promoters or whatever. And again, the idea there is the same, is that the, the quicker we can be in touch directly with the people who are grappling with different uh, questions or or or, or challenges and the, di the the quicker we can exchange and again an open transparent matter uh, manner sorry the, the quicker we can get to a not so much a compromise because as a regulator we can't compromise on the rules but the quicker we can get to a compromise into a an efficient effective and a you know a, a way forward that suits both sides of the both sides of the the conversation so I think that type of interaction with those those kind of industry groups in a, in a very general sense is is really very important and and we really do try and make use of that as well as as much as we can and i think it's also a good forum for us um to to target generally the market when we need to to give certain messages or or to share certain messages and then perhaps the the, the last piece on the communication is um what we're trying to do more and more so admittedly over the past we were probably a little bit quieter on that scene and it's something that we are working on is is more publications and publications in in different forms um and different we'll say different links or different uh, kind of levels of detail and it could, could go from just making people aware so kind of rapid snappy little uh, communications to to bring attention to certain points to uh, a document that was issued a few months ago that was more this is how we approach innovation and this is how you can get into contact with us to going forward and uh, maybe more thematic uh, reports on on certain kind of key key thoughts key key discussions key questions so perhaps I'll, I'll stop there for a moment and perhaps I'll turn it over to you Michelle and say well, is that similar to how you look at it in your market or is there any big differences in your approach at the moment <laughs> Good, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Yes. Perfect. Um, great. I, I'm, I think I missed the first part of it, uh, Karen. Uh, thank you for, first and foremost, thank you, uh, Naz and Loft, for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, it looks like it's a great show. I um, had a lot of good feedback from people who are actually physically attending the show saying that it's, um, it's, it's being done very well. So congratulations. Um, uh, and just to come back on the topic of discussion, how do we foster innovation? Um, there are a couple of things at play here. And I think Karen um, spoke about a very key aspect, which is dialogue. The dialogue with the market, the dialogue with the participants in the market, and the dialogue with the different people that are affected by the various technologies that are available out there. And I'm beginning to, <laughs> from a regulatory perspective, I'm beginning to um, really dislike that word fintech because it's 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 not going to be fintech anymore. It's, it is financial services. It is the world that we've created. It is how technology has advanced us. Um, and from our perspective, especially my perspective where I sit uh, with the pandemic uh, over the last 18 months to 20 months now, um, the level of digital adoption across this country and across this region has been phenomenal. Uh, a lot of people who have visited the UAE in the past, you would know that like a lot of other Middle Eastern countries or even the subcontinent for, for that matter, uh, Southeast Asia, people tend to rely on fiat currency a lot. People tend to rely on cash a lot. And the whole culture of cards and online payments and e-shopping was quite non-existent. And the pandemic has kind of, you know, rapidly adopted various technologies across various sectors to kind of bring all that to light. And I think from a regulatory stand standpoint, having those dialogues, um, we are a young jurisdiction. We just come, we're just coming about six, six months in October. Having those conversations right from the get-go, right from the beginning, when we were created, when we started off on this journey, to understand what the market was 
doing to understand, you know, fund managers, um, Luxembourg, speaking speaking to players there, speaking to other regulators like FCA and uh, Mass and the SEC, all across the world, talking to them, understanding what the regulators are doing, talking about what the different technologies are doing, talking about what the what the what the market actually needed. Um, so we needed to kind of make sure that we spoke to everyone across the board. Having that dialogue was extremely important. How do we foster it? We took a page off and, you know, people, we did what anyone else would do. We, we created a sandbox. We created the Reg Lab where we plugged all these various technologies and kind of, we took a page off the FCS notebook, kind of understood what they were doing, why they were creating the sandbox. And we kind of created our own Reg Lab, the regulatory laboratory where we could give them an extended period of time. We wanted two years to give them because as regulators, like Karen Cartley said, there are rules that are meant to be followed. Um, there are risk appetites that we need to make sure that we adhere to, not just from a market, but from a regulatory perspective and from a countrywide perspective. Being a government organization, you need to adhere to those risk appetites. So we gave them, rather than a three month or six month window, we gave these players two years to kind of come in, test, showcase their products to us, have tested out on participants that are, that are there right now and kind of allow us to understand what the risks are and how can we as regulators mitigate those risks? What kind of controls and boundaries can we put in place to mitigate those risks? So we came up with, you know, there, there are a lot of frameworks that the FSRA has released over the course of the last six years. Um, things like private financing platform. We wanted crowdfunding, but we do not want the risk of the crowdfunding for retail investors. And we kind of use the crowdfunding framework to kind of help startups to raise funds for their own venture capitalists or angel investors. So that's where we came up with the private financing platform, we came up with enhanced digital banking regulations with um, venture capital frameworks to help the other side, not just the text, but even to help the, the people that bring in the private, the private capital into the markets. Yes, you have government money. Yes, you have all sorts of funds. You have all sorts of accelerator programs like the Hub 71, as co-working places, innovation centers that can help you with all that, but you still need that fuel. You still need money. Capital is important. And there's only so much government money that's available to people. Um, so you need to bring in these private players. How do we do that? We enhance our venture cap frameworks. We don't want to treat them as your traditional fund managers. We want to treat them as you know people that have skin in the game. They have a lot more to lose. So let's let, reduce the regulatory requirements from our perspective, remove the capital requirements, remove space requirements, remove all sorts of uh, internal audits or finance officer requirements to make sure that, yes, you can run the business, you can invest in these startups, and we'll help you do it. We reduce the cost for them to incorporate in the ADG. So you need to look at the wider ecosystem that way. Um, going back to the regulations, we came up with VCs, PFPs, digital banks, um, money service providers, and the most important one that came out, digital securities um, and virtual assets. How do we treat uh, virtual asset service providers. How do we treat, what are the risks involved with them? Do we look at them from a product perspective and products are going to change? It's about what we define as a product, right? So the products, we are always been a conduct-based uh, regulator. So for us, we did not look at the virtual assets as the product in itself. We also looked amongst other things as the conduct being taken, taking place with virtual assets. Um, how do they, what they have for AML, what they have for CTF, what they have for custodian issues, what do you, how do they do market surveillance, do they do any market surveillance? And we had to look at all these different agendas and we, we had to make sure that, and we invited people from across the world to come sit with us across the table and tell us what the risks are, uh, what are your pain points from a regulatory perspective. Uh, we had meetings with multiple regulators. Uh, where they advised us not to go down that route and we were like, mm -hmm. we, we still want to take a risk. Um, it, it, it was adopted, it, the, the, the barrier to entry was quite high for us, in our jurisdiction at least. Um, if you look at our public register, we only have six exchanges that are licensed so far. And we wanted to keep that barrier high. So it's only the really, um, the really robust players who can actually come in and adhere to the regulations that we've set in. We wanted to bring them in. Um, and it was key. It, it, the virtual assets is a marketplace that everyone is dying to have some kind of regulation. And we were of the view that until we have, from a regulatory standpoint, we build that regulation, the institutional investors are not going to come in. 
they're just not going to play. Um, we want the sovereign wealth funds to come in. We want the financial institutions, we want the corporates, we want all of them to come in into this, into this, uh, into this field. And the only way they would come in is if these guys are regulated with the same tenacity that we regulate a, a whole of the other financial services like banks and all those guys. So you have to have that dialogue. You need to have the right regulators, the framework in place to kind of understand what the risks are. And the key to that is my third and most important point, which is the people that we, that we have. You know, being a traditional regulator would not work in this day and age. In the sense, what I mean by that is, yes, we had, when we, when, when I, when we started ADGM, we had a lot of people on the other side of the fence who were more traditionally, they're thinking. Um, then we had the complete other side that wanted to do everything. They wanted to let everyone in. Uh, but in between, you have these technologists and those guys were key. So we got a lot of good people uh, from different markets, people who understand technology, people who understand technology governance, people who are at, who have been a part of startup, who have been understanding how technology can actually enhance lives, how can reduce risks, how you can actually use the different technology to reduce the regulatory uh, requirements. We needed them to sit next to us. Like when we show them a new technology, when we show them something, you know, we might not, we will not understand it, but we need to make sure that everyone else um, could understand the risks that were in place. And once our team began to explain what these were, it kind of helped on both sides. It kind of helped us to understand the technology, to build better frameworks. Um, and then it helped from the other side, it helped the, the technology guys to understand what the regulatory frameworks were in place for, what kind of risks are, they, are we looking for? Um, and we, we just wanted to have a sustainable environment for everyone to grow, for every business to, to, to help mature and unicorns or you know, whatever the forsaken valuations of these companies are nowadays. So we want to make sure that we help them along that path. We should not be a hindrance. We should not be stifling innovation. We should try and help them grow as much as possible. I will stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you, Ishal. We have not, I uh, time is over. So if you want to resume or maybe uh, is it have a last word? No, I think um, if, if in just one little minute, I think the last thing that we want just to say is that, I mean, slightly different perhaps to, to, to Vishal is that for us, it's really working within the overall European uh, perspective. That's really key to us. Um, I mean, Luxembourg is a very small market. Uh, digitalization and the virtual assets go well beyond cross borders. So it's very important for us that the regulation is is similar and it's cross border. And I think for us, um, it's working to the greatest extent possible to have a harmonized European approach. And I think that gives regulatory certainty to the to market players, and it clearly makes our job a lot easier as well. I think they were the the last the, the last points that we wanted to cover. So. Thank you. Thank you, Karen and Vishal, for this very enriching discussion. We see that we all have the same questions, but sometimes also different concerns. So that's why it's quite interesting to see, and it's very important to exchange between regulators and regulatory bodies. Thank you. We will now move forward with our next topic, which will be focusing on understanding the new value chain of the fund in the asset management industry. To do so, we have the chance to count on the participation of the CEO of the Luxembourg House of Financial Technology, a public-private sector initiative to drive fintech innovation in Luxembourg. He sits on the IMF High-Level Advisory Group on Finance and Technology and the OECD Blockchain Expert Policy Advisory Board. He has been a non-executive board, board, executive board director, sorry, I have no glasses on, <laughs> at the traditional bank and has worked in financial services for 22 years. So please give a warm welcome to Mr. Nazir Zubairi. Please join the stage. Hello. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. It's nice to see people again. It's fantastic to be at a conference. Be it that it's been a while, I think, since I've been on a stage. I, I really don't like being on a stage. And I think most people in Luxembourg have generally been fed up of hearing me talking about stuff. And I can stand here and give a long rant and diatribe about the fund industry and it being slightly behind in terms of adoption. We can talk about crypto. We can talk about regulation if we want to. Um, 
But I find these things a little bit more interesting to hear what you guys think, actually. And I, I'd like to, if, if that's okay with you, and um, I might have to start this off by picking on people because otherwise a conversation doesn't start going, is, is to really try and engage with you to understand if you guys have any particular questions, issues, or points that you wanted to discuss. I mean, the general topic is around funds and the value chain. Um, maybe to kick us off and to be slightly controversial, um, or maybe to be honest, if depending on who you are in the audience, um, let's look at some sort of macro, macro data. The European finance industry as a whole and the banking sector, which obviously does critically have a key part to play in the fund sector as a service provider in many cases, and particularly in Luxembourg, is now the worst performing sector in the world on a regional basis. Um, I've been monitoring this data for five or six years now. Um, for a while, we were second worst performing. Um, Japan has been for a long time the worst performing banking sector in the world. Um, but as of 2020, the European banking sector is the worst performing in the world. The return on equity of the average UK, European or EU, sorry, let's, no, it's, it is European, it does include the UK as well. The average European institution is 2.75%. Any of you that sort of invest a bit will know how ridiculously bad that is. Um, major European banking institutions, finance institutions like Santander, for example. Santander had a 70% decline in profitability. Oh, sorry. Wrong one. Sogen had a 70% decline in profitability last year. Santander went from profit to loss. Um, generally speaking, the return on capital, the return on assets is pretty diabolical, quite honestly. Um, European finance is in trouble, in my opinion. I think European finance as a whole and the ivory tower which i believe we all somewhat live in in luxembourg with the fantastic fund industry i think is looking very shaky at the moment um we look and feel proud to some degree in luxembourg about how well financial services is doing uh, we talk about assets under management new records 5.5 trillion aum is that because of business or is that just because the US market's about 36,000 and fund managers have nowhere else to put that cash? Is that because businesses are efficient and profitable and building margin and ensuring that they're going to be competitive going forward? Or are we becoming less competitive on the whole over time? Are we basically looking at an industry that is in decline overall? Are we facing stiffer competition from other markets, from new asset classes? Because quite honestly, I mean, the, the breadth of asset investment that used to prevail, I think, and I say used to prevail when I sort of left university and everyone, including myself, that I know, you know, our dream job was to go and work in a bank. Nowadays, nobody wants to go and work in a bank anymore. I mean, no graduate leaves university and says, right, my dream job is to go and work in a financial corporation. It doesn't happen anymore. They want to go and work for Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, uh, one of the big techs. Um, so we have a talent problem as well, which compounds the issues of ongoing profitability. Um, costs are rising. Revenues are declining. What are we going to do? Tech, ideally, is one of those solutions, particularly in solving the cost side of the business. Um, but we need to adopt technology, and therein we also have problems, right? Procurement processes still typically take two, two and a half years, three years for a bank to implement any new technology and get it to market. And you talk to a bank and you explain to them, or financial institution, any, it's not just banks, it's any financial institution, and say, that's a really long time. Why does it take so long? You can do it faster. And they'll come up with some question or issue and reasoning around uh, bureaucracy. They need to tick all the boxes, the complexity. We're a regulated institution, I've heard before. We're very process-orientated. And I make the point that, well, Amazon is heavily process-orientated. Actually, that's one of their USPs to make them all the money that they make. 
you know. Um, they seem like a fun place to work, or people do want to go and work there, and they seem to be very productive and effective. Why aren't you? Um, why does it take you three years to implement technology? Why aren't you looking at technologies in a, in a broader sense as part of your strategic ambitions of the business? Why is technology seen as an enabler as opposed to a core strategic pillar? Um, these are all questions that I mull over. Um, why do we, why when Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two most heavily traded assets on a daily basis in the world that trade a greater volume than Bitcoin, uh, sorry, than Tesla, than Google, than Amazon, um, do we not have any funds or any service providers in Luxembourg or actually in the broader European Union that are providing access to these? Some people claim there's no demand. I mean, I think the markets are actually saying otherwise, right? 15% uh, of US citizens now have direct access to Bitcoin and Ethereum. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't see even a major fund manager creating a fund and, and wanting to um, provide access to um, a managed service or managed investments into this area. Um, we even had a traditional buy-side customer, Fidelity, I mean, an asset manager traditionally, that got a bit so fed up that they weren't able to find a service provider for their, for their desire to go into crypto and and, and, and uh, sort of other digital assets that they ended up setting up their own custodian. And uh, I've seen their numbers, they're flying. Um, there is, seems to be demand. Um, but yet, you know, the sectors we're dealing with, the fund management sector, still doesn't seem to be adopting this, this demand. Um, you know, I find it very interesting overall I think it's changed a little bit in certain verticals of financial services, but I, I still think it's the case. It's this whole resistance to change. When change is one of the major inevitabilities of our lives, along with death and taxes, right? I mean, you can't stop it. It's there, it's happening. Um, 13 years ago, we got the first smartphone and Thankfully, so far, only two people are so bored that they're on it in this audience, so that's good. But, I mean, that's fundamentally changed our lives. Our lives and the world continues to progress, continues to change. And the finance industry, which ultimately supports our drive and desire for transactions, be they transactions today or transactions tomorrow, um, and enables our ability to, 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 to enter into those transactions, um, doesn't seem to change that much, quite honestly. Um, I was talking with my friend here, Rick, who's sitting in the front. Sorry to point you out, Rick. There's Rick Cockleberg's well-known guy. You should meet him afterwards. Um, next week, there's a big conference in Amsterdam. This conference has been going on for a long time. It's called Money 2020, right? And me and Rick were musing about the fact that the 2020, they rebrand it now as saying 2020 Vision, I think, or something like that. But the original aim of the conference was the year 2020, the conference first began in 2011, if I remember, in Las Vegas. Um, we're sort of focused on the excitement and the energy of this new thing called FinTech um, to drive change in financial services. And I've got to admit, Rick, you tell me if I'm wrong, has it changed that much? I mean, we've got a few new players, but the real industry really hasn't changed. And I've got to say, the fund industry really hasn't changed at all. We've got some sort of digital um, uh, asset man wealth managers, you know, digital uh, fund solutions. Um, but they're predominantly being utilized in the US. Some of, the f um, some of the distributors in the European Union have adopted these, but there's not been any profound change in this industry. And when you look at other industries around the world and how they've been completely I revolutionized, I think, sometimes is too harsh a word. I think how these industries have evolved and evolved along with, you know, the environment, with the technologies available and the, and the demands of the customers in the market. Um, I just find it astounding how these industries or our industry doesn't change that much. I mean, we still, when signing up to invest in a fund, 
Worse still, to open a bank account, you need to fill in some forms, you need to sign it with a pen, you need to send that documentation back with a photocopy of your passport and a few other bits and bobs. I find that quite insane, really, don't you? It's um, when I can open a bank account at Revolut in about 30 seconds online, and they don't seem to be falling foul of any regulation. In fact, they've never been fined, although there's been rumors about regulators not liking them. But they've never been fined, never been fined for any regulatory breaches, whereas um, I can count pretty much every major institution in Luxembourg that has received multi-million dollar fines, be it not in Luxembourg, but in other jurisdictions, because of issues around their KYC, AML, onboarding processes. So maybe Revolut's digital method isn't so bad, right? But yet you still don't see that happening in traditional finance, um, even though it would add satisfaction and deliver on our needs. I think more than anything. We see up and coming players enter the market. We see, you know, people broaching around the scenes. We see potential for new market entrants. But nothing has really changed in this sector, not in a massive way, not in a massive way at all. And sometimes I find that incredibly frustrating. Sometimes I just think we'll have to just wait and see. But the question becomes for us here in Luxembourg, and given the economic size, scale, and impact of the fund industry, and it is a sort of backbone to the economy, how long do we wait? How long do we believe it will be okay before others start competing with us? You know, the Euro Brexit has thrown up a whole host of interesting dynamics, be it within the European Union and further afield, um, and a new sort of plane of competition. I mean, including the UK, who are looking at um, <clears throat> well, clearly sort of going their own way to some degree to be able to, to compete effectively. Um, we have new countries arising. Uh, I saw, I think it was just yesterday, that uh, in Switzerland, six finally went live with their digital asset exchange, right? That's really quite progressive. Um, you know, France has got some great initiatives going on. Germany have implemented new rules around, for example, I think two days ago, the, um, the ability to um, subscribe to and redeem into tokenized funds. Um, the UK is going get also creating a relatively open environment. Um, so there's lots of competition out there. And I mean, quite honestly, we in Luxembourg, our core is the fund industry, and we need to to ensure its and safeguard its future and future competitiveness. And as I say, I believe the, 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 the foundation of that is ultimately going to be technology. Um, and we have some a fantastic plethora of technology providers, solution providers, and many of whom are in this room, that can add value, that can help reduce costs, that can help maybe increase um, revenues and therefore impact margin and help future investments through profitability into, into new services and help institutions grow. Um, why isn't this happening? Is it happening? Do you, who in this audience has in, got investments in a fund? Can you put your hands up? Sorry? Has currently got, who's invested in a fund in some way, shape, or form? Okay. I find this interesting, unless the others were just shy, but the vast majority don't put money into a fund. You didn't put your hand up. Why don't you put, why don't you put money into a fund? Oh, you do put money in fund. Fred, did you put your hand up? Uh, I haven't put money in a fund right now. I have in the past. Oh, you had in the past. Why don't you have any money in a fund right now? Well, that's a very personal Okay, all right. <laughs> you got married, that's why. Okay, right, okay. Okay, real estate. Oh, that's an interesting alternative asset. Um, maybe a more interesting question. Um... <laughs> It's again, sorry, somebody who put mo who's put money into a fund. Where you put money into a fund. Okay, there we go. Why do you put money into a fund? <laughs> <laughs> All right, too personal. Is anyone willing to answer? Suzanne, you're willing to answer. Go on then. 
Can I, I come and interview you? There you go. I can speak loudly. So, um, well, yeah. So, very personal. I used to work in the fund industry. So, there was this exciting new fund going into the tech industry many, many years ago. So, everybody put money in. I'm probably the last one who still invested in that fund, which has been renamed about 15 times. Mm-hmm. Um, so, now it's an experiment because I'm wondering if at some point I'm going to make money with it. And I was actually just asked, you know, what's the purpose of my investment? And because the letter I received asked me to send an email back, didn't give me the email address, gave me a phone number that was wrong, asked me to send a soft copy plus email. (laughs) I was being confused, so um, I was being a bit mean. So I sent back, you know, well, it's an experiment to see if ever I will make money. And I said, okay, we'll take that explanation. (laughs) So you're waiting for money. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for money. Big time. Yeah. I mean, broad question. Has anyone here made more than 10% in the last year in the fund industry with a fund? All right. Two out of maybe the whole room. Oh, three. Okay, fantastic. Um, are you happy with, let me ask another question. Are you happy with the fees the fund managers charge? Do you think they deserve the one, one and a half percent? I mean, ETFs, okay, fine or lower, but I mean, traditional fund managers, you're talking 0.75% to one and a half percent, sometimes 2%. Do you think that's justified? Chris? Do they? They don't. But you have money in a fund. <laughs> That's interesting, right? But you could, couldn't you? Do you have Bitcoin? No? Ethereum? Speculate. Actually, that's an interesting question. Who in here has Bitcoin or Ethereum or any cryptocurrency? That's more people than have inf- invested in funds. That's interesting. My Ethereum portfolio, I think I only put in money for the first time about uh, six months ago. And some of you may find that surprising given the work I do. But I'll be honest, I used to be an FX trader in my past. Um, And I have to say, I've watched Bitcoin since it was less than a dollar. um, A dollar of Bitcoin, right? 2010. And I didn't put in, I didn't put in. I don't regret because you're taught as a trader never to regret. Um, But my big problem, and still to this day, and I've talked to many people about this, I can't understand how to price it. Um, and I have a bit of a problem with that, but in the end, I just sort of said, look, I, I've got to give up on this. It's just simply supply demand. I still have a massive issue that there's no sort of, um, invisible hand that intervenes in the market to control it. Um, that you have about 10 players that basically controls the lion's share and that can manipulate the price anyway. And I used to say jokingly, and I guess it's still true, unless the Winklevosses are telling me what they're doing tomorrow, I'm not gonna buy any of it, right? Because they basically control the market. Um, but you can't deny that it's there, right? Um, I used to try and understand the point of it. And actually, you know, people used to t- use this comparison of gold. And at first I thought that was nonsense. But actually, I saw this little comedy video, um, sort of somebody doing a little sketch of when they first discovered gold and somebody trying to use that as a means of transaction. And actually, it's exactly like gold, right? Gold is a pretty pointless metal. 40% of gold is held in bank vaults, in bullion, in coins. 10% is, and, and 40, 40 odd percent is held just in, in, um, in storage or is unmined so far. And um, about 10% is used for jewelry. There's very little real world application for gold, right? It's a completely pointless metal, really pointless. A bit like Bitcoin, really, right? Um, finite supply, yeah, we attribute massive value to this thing for some reason. I've got to shut up. Um, All right. Sorry, I've been rambling in the end. Um, Sorry? (laughs) No, no. Um, 
um, and silver is like Ethereum. So Ethereum has some levels. But it's interesting, as I say, you know, just to summarize, um, there's so much going on in the world. The world is changing. I can't imagine my, uh, my kids ever opening, well, they did try and open a bank account and they gave up and ended up with a Revolut card instead and they love it, right? Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people use these new technologies and they don't have to just be the millennials as a lot of banks like to point out. Um, it's everyone, right? Because you look at convenience and value add, be it that change is a cost to us and the older you get, change becomes a heavier cost because you become accustomed to the way you do things. Um, but if there's some value proposition, you tend to utilize something, right? We all use Ubers, we all use... Um, uh, digital payments, etc. Um, and as I said, the finance industry and the fund industry particularly really hasn't changed. And I think there's lots of little opportunities as we're going to hear from this next panel in the value chain of activities within the fund industry. The value that can be delivered. And um, but we need to see that adoption. And I hope that many of you in this audience will be able to deliver that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nazia. Thank you, Nazir, for the very insightful presentation and for your contribution to the today's summit. The next speaker of the FinTech Summit is Jesus Pena Garcia, Senior Manager, Technology, Strategy and Transformation at Deloitte. And he has come to present the topic, How Luxembourg Can Become Europe's Tokenization Hub. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. I'm happy that this is not a pitch competition because after Nasir, uh, <laughs> 20 minutes of improvising is uh, very hard for me. But I hope that you enjoyed this last 10 minutes that I prepared a small presentation regards uh, what something that I really truly believe is about the tokenization. And, and I want to, to, I'm really happy when my boss asked me on Friday, uh, to make this uh, presentation because I want to, to tell you from a regular person, I know Pascal Bouvier, I know Nasir, what is happening. Uh, and maybe at the end of the day, you will consider that the, this trend that we are speaking about tokenization is real, is real and is happening, okay? So, tokenization is the big opportunity that came sense to the blockchain, okay? And when we are speaking about tokenization, we can say that the tokenization can be everything. Can be real estate, can be paintings, can be uh, IP rights, or can be football players. So recently, there is a platform that they are trying to, to tokenize football players in an early stage. And then when they will be become popular, they will get some funds. So you imagine that the, you can invest in, in the next Messi. So this is really a big opportunity. And just to put in context to everyone, what is tokenization? So basically tokenization is the, the, the process where, where the, an issuer is able to digitalize some asset. Okay. Doesn't matter if this is a, a digital asset or physical asset. Okay. Next. And the, yes, the interest is real. So, we listen and, um, and we know from, from the FinTech Summit that there is something that is happening, but it's true here. Just to mention the forecast for the, for the next year. Um, and it's something that the, um, that the investment funds, the, 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 um, the, the wealthy person they are considering. So this is not anymore a trend or this is not anymore something with the potential. No. The, the, the potential of the digital asset uh, is here already. And why I truly believe, and many people also believe, that the Luxembourg can be the leader in, the, in this uh, new ecosystem, new, new paradigm. Basically, so Luxembourg has, uh, like we mentioned, uh, a strong regulation uh, a body, like for example, CSSF. Uh, it's coming the new market and crypto um, asset normative uh, coming in 2023. Um, there is also initiative from the government like the Bill 7363, okay? 
Then another advantage of Luxembourg is the, the, um, the general adoption. So Luxembourg at the end of the day is a small country and we can uh, be faster than other, uh, faster uh, regarding the, the taking of the decision, faster of the implementation of the different tools. So there is a, a big opportunity in Luxembourg that cannot be uh, the same in other countries like in Spain or, or in France. Then, because the characteristics of uh, um, the fan industry in Luxembourg is also uh, an advantage if we want to, to lead uh, this initiative in, in Europe. Then regarding the, the technology, of course, when we are speaking about tokenization, when we are speaking about blockchain, the biggest component is the technology. Luxembourg is doing very well, attracting key players in tokenization, like everybody knows, for example, the, the one of the biggest is Tokeny and is in Luxembourg. Um, then uh, we can speak also about custody solutions. So at the end of the day, the um, the the tokenization itself will happen when when everyone adopt. Um, everyone will be used to 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 play with the digital asset. Um, at the end, also something to mention is just the European institution. Uh, are in Luxembourg and we can take advantage. So, next. So, how to make it happen? I know that this is the motto from uh, Luz Innovacion, but uh, I like it. Um, basically, it's clear and it's always the same. Even if we are speaking about digital assets, we are speaking about tokenization, at the end of the day, it's the same. It's like uh, we need to continue investing as a country in the technology, in technology part we need to attract the key players to come to Luxembourg and to develop the, the, um, the business and the initiatives here. Uh, also, just to, to, to leverage the will of the government uh, regards a new framework, new uh, um, legal schemas regards the, the positioning of uh, Luxembourg as a hub. Um, and the last point is like uh, we need to, to work together all the different players service provider, technology provider, uh, regulators, because I don't believe that any of us, we have the, the, the right answer for a complex uh, situation. So there is initiative like uh, working well, like InfraChain in, here in Luxembourg, but maybe it's the time that the service provider, ten, technology providers or regulator, they can work together in order to, to, to be the, the leader in this aspect. And as I promised, it's a very short uh, presentation. Uh, I respect the siesta because in Spain, we try to, to keep it this like a, a sacred. So I, I, I just want to, to mention that if we are ready for this change um, from a regular person like me, it's like uh, pay attention because it's happening, the change. Go back to home, open your wallet and start investing because it's the next thing. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for this interesting presentation. Thank you for respecting more than a time. Good. <laughs> and having an interesting presentation. That's quite important. So to continue, we'll now host the first round table of the afternoon, which will be led by Nicolas Gerard, Managing Director, Head of EMEA Regulatory Reporting Products at State Street Bank, Luxembourg. And we go in depth with the challenges of the fund tech and investment industry. He is joined by Paolo Brigat. Rinia Dallo, Chief Com Commercial Officer at Funds DLT, Bert Bormann, CEO Governance.com, Ravel Wood, Founding Partner One Group Solutions, and An Sanuni, Partner One Group Solutions. Please join me on the stage and I will let Nicolas introduce your discussion. Thank you. Right. Okay, it works. Thank you very much. So the first part of my speech of my intervention is already done because introductions uh, have been made with this uh, brilliant panel. Uh, what we wanted uh, to discuss today is really the future of interactions uh, between fundtechs and uh, the larger industry. Okay, this is 
This is a topic that has been at, at the very heart of the loft agenda for years. Um, and we actually all are part of a task force, which we call the Asset Management Fundtech Task Force. Uh, our objective is to um, look at basically the value chain uh, of the fund industry and see how we can help and how fundtechs can collaborate and help each other. So obviously, uh, we will not uh, knock at every door and see who can collaborate with whom. Uh, our, our most tangible objective is actually to publish a white paper in the coming weeks, which will look at a few at the problem statement, what we can do, what are the potential solutions, and take a few uh, use cases as examples uh, to showcase basically that the collaboration uh, can help the wider industry. Okay, So maybe if we look first at the problem statement, how did we identify the problems? Uh, I'd like to, uh, Daniele, ask you a question. Why, why was the loft involved in this and why did the loft create such a task force? Yes, uh, thank you, Nicola. So uh, since the creation of the loft uh, back in 2017, uh, the main purpose has always been to promote the innovation and promote the fostering of the innovation. So when we were supporting our businesses, we actually understood that there were many pain points in the asset management industry in Luxembourg. And we believe that the key solution is the collaboration of the different pl uh, players, uh, the different actors in the, in the industry. So just taking both um, the actors of the traditional financial sector and the actors of the startup world, putting them together around the table and understanding how to provide practical solutions to these uh, problems, it was the easiest uh, way for us to promote this innovation to provide insights to the government about what was happening in this industry, and at the end, to provide practical solutions that can be really used by the companies and can be really showcased by the companies in, in the industry to provide additional value then for the final customers. This was the reasoning uh, of the loft uh, about creating different task forces in, in the different industries. Thank you, Daniele. Uh, Bert, for, for, from your perspective, you've been really one of the driving forces uh, of this task force. What has been uh, the thought process that we followed? How, how have we structured basically this task force and, and, our, and, our, pro, and, our, and our thought process basically? Yeah, so like uh, Daniela said, the fintech, fintech ecosystem is developed quite well in Luxembourg and the government has supported this for seven, eight years, I would say. So the, the, it has bloomed into a, a very big map of, uh, of fintech solutions. But unfortunately, the hard, harsh reality is that the adoption is not really happening as much as we would like. And, and one of the reasons why why Luxembourg wants this fintech or specifically funtech to happen is because it also helps the industry. So it's not just to create an ecosystem of tech companies, but also because the financial sector, specifically fund management, is huge uh, here in Luxembourg. Um, and so, yeah, so, but, so you have all these tech companies that have solutions that they want to sell to clients, and you have all these financial institutions that need tech solutions because they're dying, and uh, but somehow the adoption is not there. And so... So a lot of people are looking into this problematic. It's one of the most discussed things. The ABBL recently published a fantastic paper. So uh, whoever hasn't read that one yet, I would really advise you to read that, which was uh, trying to identify between banks and fintech specifically. Why, why isn't it working? And so some of the things that they said was the when 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 financial institutions look at implementation of tech solutions, they're worried about integration uh, topics and, and also the depth of what a one, one company can provide. Because you say, yeah, that's great, that one solution. But then when the people on the workflow say, well, that's fantastic, that's just what I need. And then they introduce that into their very large organization and it goes up the chain, then people have a trouble connecting that to a wider transformation roadmap. Because they say, yes, it's just one thing and where's the rest? And so then it, then it grinds down into this big multi-year in, uh, integration uh, projects. And so, so our approach here was that if integration and depth of solutions is one of the identified problems, let's see that rather than pushing individual solutions, let's see if you can combine multiple solutions and then try to connect it with actual use cases that people are suffering uh, from a day-to-day -day, uh, perspective. So rather than 
continue to push saying, all right, here's this, this one solution that does just process automation, but they say, let's look at a, at a value, uh, value chain, a process in that value chain, and how can you then uh, make this puzzle of solutions? Okay, and well, actually the, the fund industry is much larger than uh, fund managers collecting fees. Huh? Whether or not Nazir likes it, it's much bigger. I know he's trying to reduce those fees, but not everyone is happy about it probably. Uh, but Paolo, uh, looking at you know the value change, which were the problem statements we identified and which were the use cases we focused on, which were probably specific to Luxembourg? So in the in the in the task force we we um, um, Beth was saying that we really focus on uh, value chain. So to try to find a, really a point that was making sense for the market, we really uh, design again uh, and again because it's, it's almost using in, in many many activities a value chain, a value chain that was focused really from from the creation of a product up to the the commercialization and then also the control and oversight of the business once it's up and running into the, into the market. So having designed a value chain, of course, it's a large value chain that really encompasses many, many activities. And uh, of course, uh, this is still was not making sense. It was too large, too wide to create value for the, I would say for a task force, also for, for the industry. Again, we always seen many fantastic diagrams, fantastic uh, plan uh, that wants to re revolutionize everything. So we continue the process and we focus further into more and deep dive into specific use cases, a specific value creation. So uh, we select a few ones in order to focus on that. Of course, we focus mainly in one that is very important for Luxembourg as a fund industry, fund center, that is distribution, that is an international distribution of product. So when you already have created a product, has been designed, has been set up, then it starts the problem of distributing the product in the market. That this is composed by several steps, several functions, several also uh, competencies uh, and uh, systems implied into this uh, process. So we, uh, we uh, focus on that, and the intention was to map uh, companies that are in the Luxembourg fund, uh, fintech ecosystem to see whether these companies working together might create value chains that deliver, fast deliver value to existing actors, that, that can complement and can combine activities with the mostly legacy operation systems, legacy environments, and at the same time, uh, fast creating, adopting new technology. And this is very important for us as a task force because uh, we want to create really compelling uh, use cases that can be, I would say, read on paper and say, okay, let's try it. Let's try it even at least to, to start a journey, a digital transformation journey. Thank you, Paolo. Um, Rival, you represent a, a very important component of Luxembourg, the management companies. And I'm actually not sure if you're part of the incumbent, you know, industry or the fintech right now. <laughs> it's kind of blurred, but um, it, it's interesting. And really, I wanted to thank you because you joined uh, the task force midway to give your perspective as a management company, as, an, uh, as a consumer of those solutions. So for you, wh what is your interest in fostering this greater collaboration? Yeah, thank you, Nicola. So we have had, and over 12 years in the third party space, the, the unique view of the market, whether it was at Northern running RBS, uh, back to, to Nazir's point, I probably became the, the family black sheep when my brother realized as an engineer, I was an accountant and a banker. I said, well, I've never worked in a bank, but I ran a fund management. But still, um, as a third party, we have the unique uh, perspective of, you know, uh, uh, working with 300 plus independent directors uh, 30 plus administrators, um, the whole 
plethora of big four law firms and and multiple other suppliers. So we we like a spider web that sees the spider in the middle of the web that sees everything, and and unlike the in house where the, the large fund management firms who uh, some of these points have been touched on inertia complacency made too much money in the past that's changing with margin squeeze, uh, and and therefore the technology wasn't uh, core, but. Um, having set up our own firm, um, we looked at this and there's nothing that connects the dots across the industry. It's very difficult to go and find uh, a fund management solution that goes from the delegate oversight, the capturing of the golden source data from the administrators through the risk compliance, et cetera, the board reporting, the whole remit. It's in, it doesn't exist. So we thought, um, you know, to try bridge that, we, we formed one group as uh, the next gen of uh, uh, management company. That doesn't mean, and you, you rightly said, we're not a tech company, but what we're trying to do is join the dots with great tech companies like Governance, like Nextgate Tech, like UMI, we'll cover some of these, uh, and, and, and others like Fancella and others on, uh, on the panel. But um, trying to choose the best in, in class underlying engines, because there's great technologies, but they're all siloed and, and don't connect. And, and then we, what we try to do is look at how we bring that together. Um, you know, the challenges remain the same decentralized, non-standardized data, uh, lack of market standards. So that's one of the things we're really pushing for is to try create real market standards. Not, you know, I remember we published uh, when I led at Alfie the due diligence on distributors, but we're not allowed to call it that because no one could decide what a distributor was. So then it was, um, and I have to remember, um, the oversight of uh, financial intermediaries in the distribution process. Uh, there was a long way of saying oversight of distributors. But that's the complexity of it is, you know, just trying to get those standards siloed, disconnected technologies. So it's really difficult to pull all that together. And, and I think the loft uh, pulling this initiative together to look at that value chain and trying to create something that's unique to Luxembourg. And, and I know very few put up their hands when investing in funds, but I'd hate to break the bubble. I think you all invest in funds through your pension scheme and every now and then you have to reevaluate where you invest those funds. But, uh, but so I think it's an imp incredibly important uh, industry, even with the rise of Bitcoin and Ethereum and others. Uh, I think many of us are still exposed to th funds. Thank you, Riven. So, in the thought process, as Bert and uh, Paolo explained, we, we deep dived into a couple of topics uh, which are uh, very important for Luxembourg, quite specific to Luxembourg. Uh, fund, document, fund documentation was one of them. Uh, Bert, this is a, a key area of focus and it can look very simple to the, to the non-expert, but where are the challenges and roadblocks you'd love to fix and you'd love to, to, to ease? Yeah, everybody always says documents is easy, but uh, I think it's probably the biggest pain point that everybody is dealing with because of the fact that the, because of documents, data is distributed, is not connected, and it, if it's not connected, it's very difficult to use. And so when you talk about document management, that's a lot of things, of course. I mean, you have the just the production of the uh, of the uh, conceptual documents of the fund. I mean, the, the fund prospectus or the PPM, that is a huge piece of work to get all the information together and to have that consistent, but then, then to connect that consistently with the regular uh, performance updates that you send out, uh, the kits that you need to produce, the Manco reports, audit reports, uh, Lots of different documents need to be produced. And in order to produce those documents, you need to do what? Collect more documents. And, and so it's a, it's a very, very big puzzle. And so that is one of the use cases that we are indeed now looking into is saying, if, if we look at uh, even within that document production, there, there should be categories because documents are not documents. But if you look at, for example, the production of a Manco report, uh, specific, which is a big topic for, uh, for, for a management company, is something that you need to do periodically. Uh, I can promise you 90% of the industry does that by Word templates and Excel spreadsheets and copy pasting. And that's a recipe for disaster because uh, one copy paste mistake and you send out the wrong information. So what do we do? We put five committees on top of it in order to control and control and control. So. The complexity with, with uh, the production of a, of a Manco report doesn't just require one solution, like a, a tool to publish a, a report. Because before you can publish a report, you first need to collect the information. 
in order to have the information, you need to aggregate data from multiple sources. Uh, Ravel said it before, fund administrators, TAs, depository, all this information needs to come together. I interrupt. I <coughs> disagree there. You do need one solution. <laughs> yeah, you need one solution. Yes, you don't need one tool. Yes, exactly. So you need you need you need a, a solution to the problem. But in order to get there, you need to do the aggregation of the data. When when you have the data, then you need to control it. You need to calculate risks. You need to run that through a committee. So there's multiple steps involved. So one of the cases that we are currently describing and we hope to publish soon, saying how can you combine different tools? And so, for example, if you want to collect data from multiple parties, there's this uh, company called Nextgate Tech. So they, they connect, collect that from, uh, from fund administrators, from TAs. They do the risk scoring. But then, then what? Well, then that becomes exceptions, for example. Well, then you publish that into the next part of the chain. And so that is one of the cases that we're describing where we think if you manage to already take 50% of the work out of that process, that already saves so much time, which then enhances the quality of the remaining time that you spent on actual quality controls. And um, a good lesson about how to cleverly brand your new company uh, that we just heard to make sure uh, it's placed. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Rivel, coming back to you, uh, fund distribution is obviously, and sorry, we should call it, what is it, intermediaries and uh, whatever. Uh, fund distribution is the second key element uh, that we chose to deep dive on. Um, its importance to Luxembourg, it's obvious, you know, we, we have the largest uh, distribution uh, channel in the world. Uh, wh where do you see potential synergies? And um, the opposite is, is harmonization a good thing? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, why distribution? Um, and, and I think there's another area where, again, there's incredible inefficiency. And, and, and those who are in, in the space that we operate in would know it. So uh, I won't mention any uh, particular asset management firms, but think of any uh, of the largest. One might start with a black something, uh, stones and, you know, others. But they all, whether it's, uh, you know, three-letter acronyms, uh, etc. they're all overseeing the same, whether they're overseeing State Street, overseeing RBC, BBH, combined organization now, uh, HSBC, etc. Um, there's incredible inefficiency. Each of those firms has a fund accounting oversight team. So that's one area. But of course, there's only eight administrators in, in the distribution space. I remember Noel Fessy when he was at Schroeder saying they had 2,000 distributors. And if his team sat every day on a plane, 24 hours a day, they wouldn't cover them all. Um, it's and, and of course, Schroeder's and, and, and all the other names. Sorry, I broke my rule and didn't mention a name. But all, if all of those asset managers are overseeing the same distributors, that's an incredible incredibly inefficient uh, operating model for you, the end investor, uh, invest in funds through your pension scheme. Um, so ultimately, we said this is an area where particularly the distribution, the one-to-many relationship uh, can be reduced and, and improved. And I think there's some great examples of this. And I'm talking really about the liquid space, the highly distributed funds. And then I'll touch on the illiquid space in a minute. But on the highly distributed funds, where you have these long chains of distributors, uh, uh, and they can go into the hundreds or thousands, and you have to go, we as the uh, 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 Manco have to go and look down that distribution chain, um, incredibly cumbersome and, and, and time consuming. And names like, and again, uh, one of the firms that um, we felt we did a due diligence on the market and again, chose best in breed. So we work with UMI and I, and I love the concept. It's a great concept where mutualization, they do the distribute, the due diligence once uh, on XYZ, and I think they now have 5,000 distributors uh, on behalf of a much smaller subset of managers. So it's a great, great model. Um, and I think their efficiencies can be gained uh, in the uh, distribution space, less so in the, in the administration space, but kind of overseeing many people will use Knipe or other uh, service providers and, and, and you have to do regular uh, vendor due diligence. Again, it's, it's just completely inefficient for everyone to do that themselves. So I think there's uh, efficiencies there. On the private capital side, um, you know, then there's uh, technologies that are coming to the fore that can help in a different way because you can't get those efficiencies because more private placement individual. But what you can do is using technology give access. So today, um, these large 
private equity firms, you have to be in a certain uh, wealth bracket to be able to invest, mostly institutional. But why not um, make that available to a much broader spectrum through things like, and it was mentioned earlier by Nazir, tokenization, tokeny stock or and others. So I think the whole distribution space, either from a oversight perspective or uh, accessibility, there's lots of opportunities for tech. Thank you. And, and that's actually a, a very good transition to Paolo and, and your business model uh, with Funds DLT. And I actually wanted to throw a bit of a curveball to you. Uh, so I'll ask you to do some self-inflicting damage. Um, according to you in the distribution space, so in the transfer agency world, is there a future outside the blockchain? May I say no, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, uh, um, there is still a future anyway. Uh, how much these futures will last? And that's the question. Uh, we see uh, indeed uh, from our perspective that uh, blockchain is really taking, um, really starting to be adopted in many other business and uh, creating value. We recently, then, some statistics demonstrate that there is a more and more investment and use and consistent investment from VC into blockchain technology. So technology, uh, blockchain is uh, really uh, emerging from, I would say, the early stage where we see the Bitcoin, the famous crypto, and the, what damage they done to the technology as well. Um, but it's true that, and I listened to this panel and also the, the question from Nazir before, we start seeing really the, really the planet being aligned. So the dots being connected and we see that the value is really becoming evident for the blockchain utilization. In the fund industry and the fund distribution space, what will bring the, the blockchain is really the capacity, the ability to really manage and, and really, I say manage the, really the re register of our investors on a really very granular scale at the atomic level. And that is something that always has been demanded by the industry. And there is also another component that's very important is really the cooperation with the distribution side as well, because distributors are replicated almost the same activity that has done that the fund side. They have to onboard clients, they have to <laughs> control the clients, they have oversight their distribution activity from a product perspective, from a market perspective. So the, a decentralized infrastructure that is, I would say, connected through a blockchain can really enable a data sharing and data can possibility to share data between the producer and the, and the consumers up to the, having a visibility on the end investors. And that's thanks to the blockchain. Alternative to this one, this model, yes, probably still it's possible to have a decentralized approach done differently, but probably at the capacity in that, and the, in the ability of the blockchain to share data between in actors, not. That's my... Thank you. Uh, pa Paolo, I, I think, We'll start maybe um, going through the uh, closing of, of this session. Um, Paolo, during all discussions we've had, I think the sentence you said the most is, it's important to be concrete and focused on tangible actions. What is your advice uh, on this? Uh, why do you say that? And is it applicable to the fun tech in general? Well, uh, in our experience, what we are experiencing at the moment in deploying our solution in the market, of course, is an adoption. And I've already been said during this panel and previously, adoption is very critical. And the complexity, when we talk and we discuss with companies, is really their ability to adopt new technology. There, there's still probably not an... Uh, um, uh, it's a difficult process anyway. Uh, it should be understood. Decisions uh, are difficult to be taken. Above all, because you touch existing business, it's difficult to change existing business. Once you work in the operational side, you have to care about the risk. Above all, the, and you have to ensure that. So changing process is something that is really your least uh, um, needs to be said. But there is any way a need to change a model. We have been said already that there is a cost. There is a need for cost efficiency. So it's the process of adopting technology. So launching new uh, use cases, started adopting and uh, working with new fintechs. That's where the industry have to really improve. Thank you. And 
on on the same um, same vein as we say in French, sorry, uh, Rivel and Bert, you're both innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, <laughs> one is more an innovator, the other an entrepreneur. Maybe I don't know. Um, what support structure or infrastructure do you wish you had access to uh, to help you basically grow and uh, to help Luxembourg grow as a as a center of technology for the future? That I would have had access to, or that I want to have access to? You can say you have time for both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So what I would have had, like to have access to what somebody telling me how bloody hard it was going to be to break into the financial sector <laughs> because we thought, okay, you have a great solution. There's a big problem. We can go and fix it. And so we didn't expect that it was going to be that hard. You know, if you don't have, first you don't have capital, then you don't have reference clients, then you don't have, uh, 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 then you don't have the, uh, the, the proven technology, uh, uh, then you don't have the people that can do the political discussion. So. What we would have had liked to have is loved 10 years earlier <laughs> because probably that discussion should have started much earlier. That would have been great. What well, I think what, what will help now because, okay, we are now seven years down the line and we can see that now things are really moving, but I can see a lot of other companies are still in this struggle mode because of much earlier. And what would really help, and we hope also that with this initiative we, we facilitate that, is to, to get companies to try it earlier. So everybody is always talking about sandbox and sandbox for me is not so much in the term of regulatory sandbox, but a way where you can test out different solutions. By the way, you're going to pay for it. It's not going to be for free because entrepreneurs are not free educators. We are there <laughs> also to run a business, but where you can try out different solutions and combinations of different solutions earlier on in order to get people to move uh, and take action on that. So I think that that would really move the fintech scene ahead. Thank you. <coughs> Raven? Yeah, I think, you know, having come out of uh, a, a really wonderful uh, large organization, Northern Trust, who invested a lot, and I can't quote the numbers now, but, you know, a lot in technology, and then a big bank, um, RBS, where it was non-core. We had some great risk and compliance engines, which were designed for a big bank, but, um, you know, what we had the benefit of when we started one was, uh, which is a real challenge for uh, many of the players. Again, won't mention names in the in the fund management space. Is we had the advantage of no clients, uh, no license, no infrastructure, lots of uh, uh, no legacy, um, but you know, uh, gr great new technologies to pick from, uh, yeah. and a clean slate. Uh, and and that's a real challenge for a lot of the industry. So that's not a, a you know a, a wish list, but I think uh, you know some of those large managers being able to put that mindset on that you know to go and change those 30 year old legacy systems which ultimately culminate in Excel and email and word um, it's 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 difficult and maybe you know a, a, a willingness to step and look at some uh, you know smaller firms we grew to 80 clients in in less than two years in the fund management space uh, in, and, and and in the governance space that's because we were able to be agile and, and, uh, you know, I won't quote the names, uh, State Street helped us right in the beginning with uh, a piece of business, but we've got some of the biggest global brand, uh, names linked to us and uh, they put out their trust in a startup. Uh, and I think it's that what the wish list though is still, uh, market standards incredibly difficult and it's got to come not from the advisory firms or the consultants it's so difficult it's got to come from uh you know the regulator a little bit yeah. starting to put standards around the the prospectus i know it's a hugely unpopular thing to say if there's any lawyers in the in the, in the room but you know it's standards around the prospectus standards around how we deliver information to the regulator because then it will drive everything uh, back to the manco to how we consume um and i think that you know this initiative by the loft again credit to the loft and, and we're thankful for the, everything that the loft has done also in in promoting this end to end but trying to get that value chain connected thank you and and i agree with you on on the standards i've had a lot of discussions about kpis on timeliness should it be at class level or at fund level very 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 important <laughs> now tough discussions but it doesn't change the face of the world of course 
Um, Daniele, I leave the last question for you. What's on your wish list for the, from a loft perspective? That we solve practically some of the problems that we're facing today um, in the different industries. We have been created for that. Uh, we want to provide uh, additional instruments to the entrepreneurs from one side, but also to the traditional financial sector to solve these problems and to do it now, not in a few years to come. Correct. I agree. <laughs> so thank you very much to my four very interesting panelists. Thank you. Thank you. This was very, very interesting uh, discussion. So thank you all for joining us today at the occasion of the FinTech Summit. The following presentation is entitled Data as an Asset, Shifting Paradigms Through a FinTech Optic. And we have the chance to count on two experts from PVC Luxembourg, Lionel Nicola, Asset Servicing Leader at PVC, and Benjamin, Benjamin Gauthier, Partner at PVC. As both advisory partners, they, they combine together expertise in different fields, such as alternative investment management, risk and regulatory compliance, microfinance, ESG, project management, organization review, strategic positioning, and system implementation. Lionel Benjamin, the audience is yours. And where are they? Hiding. Yeah, yeah. Are you? <laughs> Hiding. Yeah, okay. So. Yeah, you should also be on stage, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, we've heard a lot about the, um, the tech revolution, and actually in Luxembourg, it has been mainly like the fintech, the, rin the rec tech. And then on top, uh, we have now all the other buzzwords, like the blockchain, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning. And, and the question we want to address, because actually our slot is quite short, is where do we stand here in Luxembourg? in terms of leveraging on the data set we have access to, or we think we have access to. And then the second question is mainly about what are the major changes that we experienced from a technology standpoint over the last five years, and what is it that we expect for the new future? So as a first step, I would like to just talk briefly about the, I don't know, I always switch the slides actually to go for the next one. I don't know if there is a, something to switch from one to another. We don't have it anyway. We can start with the first topic, which is about the, the challenges that the, the industry is facing when we have to collect data. The first thing is that we have, and you're probably all aware of this, we have a range of players. We have banks. We have banks also acting as a depository. We have transfer agent. We have fund administrators, TA, and all these ones. And guess what? They don't have the same setup. If we then we look at... Uh, the type of solutions they are using, there are common solutions. If we look at the main ones that we have, we have Multiform, we have GP3, we have Efront, we have all these big ones. But guess what? They all have their own implementation. And then sometimes when you look at the specific features, they go for like a setup that they do on an Excel spreadsheet next to it. So actually collecting the information is not that easy. And then... Uh, we thought a lot about having, you know, using artificial intelligence, for example. But sometimes you have documents where even the human spending a lot of hours will not find out what he's looking for. So how is it that technology will solve that? Final point is about the protection of data, because sometimes the rules, the regulation, and also all these points can't give you access to that. So that's clearly a challenge that we've all been observing when it's about data collection. We have tons of data. We can have probably access to it, but actually going to the final step is not that easy. So so just a question, because Lionel, I've been talking about the data piece, and we have the tech piece on the other side. And actually, my feeling is that while we have been observing a lot of good technology and solutions, we still have a low penetration and not probably the kind of massive changes we were maybe expecting. Yes, Benjamin. And 
Um, the question is really, why do we have such a low penetration rate? Is it because we are missing in Luxembourg some experts in new tech or data? I don't think so. So there are other reasons. Let me maybe share my views on, on that. Um, I think the first one, the procurement process for fintech is still very rigid. The traditional five to three years of financials to be provided is quite uh, not an easy way for these fintech to, to, to comply with. Then I think as well, the, the lack of autonomy of the local players in the decision-making process is also something which is a bit uh, difficult for them, at least for the clients of these fintechs. If we take, for example, the management company, um, they are not necessarily considered as a priority from the headquarter, from the head office, but more as a cost center, not necessarily bringing value. The due diligence process is also very demanding for the fintech, and it's also quite onerous for them. But as thing as well, the fintech offer too often a very mono product approach, while the potential clients are more demanding on a wide range of the value chain concept and the different pieces of the value chain, which is potentially something which is different from what the fintech can offer to their clients. Benjamin, maybe you can share with us some example of fintech which today can transform our ecosystem in Luxembourg. Yeah, so I will not talk maybe about specific names because we have tons of very good ones, but I just want to do, illustrate some of the situation. We're actually looking further, going for core development types of approach was kind of a good way of working and, and then actually a, a success at the end. So... If you, I just want to give some examples. We've been, for example, uh, working with uh, solutions doing due diligence type of, uh, of um, tools, sharing questionnaires, doing the follow up and all this. And then suddenly when you have the discussions with your clients, they are telling you, oh, that's kind of good. That's what I'm looking for. But if I'm using this, I want to be able to store all my documents into this. Guess what? That solution is not being made for that. But there are certainly others. In that case, there are others that you can put next to it so that you have the full range. So maybe a message here is also about sometimes for these players to also think about working together. And that's not easy because you feel, oh, I have my own solution. And why is it that I should work with others? Then you might have also the, um, uh, the situation where we've been working, for example, uh, with the data management solution. And actually what we realized is that these guys were super good at doing this, giving permanent access to the platform, web-based, with everything you need. But when it was about interacting with the source of information, being the fund administrators and all the ones that I've been mentioning before, maybe within that specific company, they don't have the people who actually have the sufficient experience to actually find out what is it that they want to collect and actually go to, to the final step. So it's also about working together and that example is probably one. Another one that we have seen recently was a company proposing the capacity to have all the holding charts of uh, uh, investment structures with the SPVs and so on, very well structured. But actually when you discuss with your clients, they say, oh, if I have that, I would like also to be able to um, have a full monitoring if I have prepared all the documents, the filing, the tax filing, and so on that I had to do for these entities. So there's always a, a situation like, I like it, but I would have liked to have this or that on top. So it's about collaboration probably between different companies so that together they would be stronger, having in mind the type of expectation they can have from their clients. The last piece and that's probably an important one coming to your point, Lionel, about everything about uh, going for the onboarding process and all the questions you can have. Actually, um, something that is quite important and working for PwC, which is a big organization, I am think that some of you might have the same situation. We realized that actually, even though we pretend we still have a lot of agility, we lost a portion of it because actually we became big and with processes and all this. The good thing about partnering with these type of uh, companies, very agile, coming with new ways of working and so on, is that sometimes the agility that you lost as a big company, partnering with them, you will gain their agility that actually you lost. So actually that's also something that I've been observing over the last five years working with uh, several of these companies is that actually there's either something missing that could be added by another partner or sometimes by partnering with them, actually you gain a lot of acceleration into the process. 
one of the screens shut down, but no. <laughs> we don't have any more the timing. Suppose it's fine. So um, maybe um, a, a question for you, uh, Lionel, is that we've been identifying the challenges and opportunities, and what what would actually uh, transform uh, our Lux Financial Center? I think uh, I have a couple of ideas, but I think it's more than ideas because some of them are already existing. Um, I think the first one is the concept of utilities that clearly exists so far in Luxembourg. For example, on the IML KYC, so know your customer um, business arena. Um, but do we have enough utilities in Luxembourg? I don't think so. Do we need to have more? I do think so. I think an industry-sponsored approach would be good. And I, I believe that there are many benefits to that. First, uh, in terms of consistency and efficiency, clearly it's an advantage. Um, in terms of cost as well, a huge cost reduction if we have proper um, utilities. And then, of course, in terms of regulatory oversight, everything would be centralized and it would be clearly an advantage also, the use of uh, the utilities. The second example that I want to share with you, and now we don't have any more. Yeah, it sounds like we are Britain Got Talent. You know, we had the first cross, red cross, because that one went down. That second one went down. We now have something else. So I hope we're st you're still happy that we're on stage. <laughs> Um, the, the second one is uh, the concept of partnership. Um, for example, funds DLT. I think it's also something which um, exists in Luxembourg when different entities put together working with the same objective. So the funds DLT working on the funds industry, combining different stakeholders from the asset servicing to the investment management. I think it's also a very good idea for, for Luxembourg. Um, managed services, that one as well. Why don't we outsource more some low value added task to a centralized entity which would benefit to the, to the industry? And of course, the, the last two points, blockchain, DLT, um, I think it's going to be a proven methodology in the future and that we need to more rely on in Luxembourg. And of course, all what is related to cryptocurrencies and uh, tokenization uh, is probably also uh, for the future to be really uh, contemplated in Luxembourg. So, as part of the final words and, and the key messages that we wanted to share with you, uh, if we start with the um, the first one, so um, here technology innov innovation, it's alive and kicking, but so here uh, that's coming back to the messages we had before. So identifying the right company, the right technology, and then probably partnering with them to go a step further. So maybe we can go to the next one, which is exactly what I've been saying here. It's about partnering, but also it's for all the companies working with them to actually maybe identify how to best work with them, directly interacting and avoiding that we go through um, a central uh, committee was trying to define what is it that they will do with that and then finally going through tons of processes and then we are lost into the whole process so go straight and last piece is coming back to the first one that I had before don't be afraid and start to work with them on our side and I'm happy to have separate conversation we recently had several very um, productive con collaboration with very strong results but it's because actually these companies were open to partnership with us that actually it went quite well Another important point that we want to share with you is, of course, oh, sorry, um, the fact that um, locally all the entities which are based in Luxembourg should have a greater level of autonomy, which means that um, selecting the proper fintech here locally for the specific needs should be more common in the future. Um, if we remember the COVID time in March, April last year, we have just in a couple of days, maybe two weeks, moved from a office based to a home based office without many intervention from the headquarters and i think that was a great success demonstrating that we can do a lot locally and last i think important we should not um, forget that we can do everything we want so the philosophy of it cannot be done should not be permissible in the future
So welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your break. We're going to continue. We have to skip the following pr the, the presentation, which was planned after the break, because we have some connect connecting issues. So we're going to take move immediately to <coughs> Beltran Office, uh, who will continue with uh, of CEO of Digital US, who will continue with a pro uh, presentation on open source intelligence for KYC and AML. He is currently in the process of launching along alongside fellow co-founders the next spin-off of SNT called the Digital US. It di digital US, sorry. <laughs> It has also already been a long afternoon for me. It is a search engine designed to empower compliance officers in their KYC AML duties by providing a holistic view of the customer's public digital footprint. So welcome. That's right. Ah, sorry, it's here. Yeah. <laughs> on the microphone, if you wish, or oh, you take this one, okay. Okay, hello, hello, fantastic, good. Right, so um, let's begin by having a definition of what open source intelligence is. Now this can be defined as actionable intelligence produced from publicly available information. Now, rather than providing you more definitions, I'm simply gonna run through what can be considered as a KYS, or know your speaker. So rather than providing information about my background, Let's find it online. So we already have a picture and my name. We can do the very first thing that any of us would do, which is to go on Google and identify different sources of information. Now, one of the very first tools that everyone uses is LinkedIn. From this profile, we can already identify information such as my locations that I've lived in, uh, companies that I've worked at, and from this information, we can already glean websites that might contain more information about me. For example, the website of my company and my previous employers. As a little um, extra, if you notice at the bottom, there is a slight uh, source code that I've uh, highlighted. If you look into your profile in LinkedIn and identify your member ID, you're actually able to identify the date or at least approximate the date which the profile got created. In my instance, because I'm member ID 66 million, this means that my account must have been created at the beginning of 2010. This is another example of data that is actually available online, just not directly displayed. In addition to this, now we know that I have uh, academic publications, so we can do what is known as Google dorking, which is the idea of utilizing Google filters and identifying specific documents. In this particular scenario, I have taken my name and I have looked for PDF documents within the server of the University of Luxembourg. This yields 19 papers and publications, and from there we can simply extract, using natural language processing, information about the topics that I have worked in. So in this particular example, you can see I've worked with transactions, blockchain, smart contracts, and security. In addition to this, we can already identify close associates based on the co-authors of my publications. We can utilize the exact same technique to actually find articles and uh, blogs and uh, different newspapers articles that are, contain similar information. And you'll notice that this provides a completely different image of my content online. In this particular case, the keywords basically identify that I'm the CEO of a startup looking for funding, because all of them look the same. But if you actually use entity resolution, you can identify names of persons, companies, and locations that are also associated with my name. If we go to my company website, we can already identify a new piece of information, an address in Esch to Alz. This address is specifically where the company is hosted at the University of Luxembourg Incubator. With this information, we can already uh, look into the source code of the website and identify where the data is hosted and identify the username that is used by me across multiple platforms. In this particular case, AACUS in GitHub and BBFSP across multiple platforms. And once you identify usernames uh, commonly used by an individual, you start opening a wealth of data. In fact, the data that we used till so far is what is called the surface information, which is the surface web. And this represents between four to 10% of the actual content of the web. If we're actually going in deeper into uh, uh, other databases, other social media platforms and other repositories, we're actually able to grow this fun data even further. Again, now that we have 
my username, we can identify social media platforms where my profiles are easily located. So even if my names are distorted or changed, you can still identify me using image recognition. And based on the fact that you can find my Instagram, my Facebook, but no TikTok, you can already glimpse another fact. I'm a millennial. Now, with the information about the companies that we have already highlighted, we can go into the business registers and identify companies in which I am a, a beneficial owner. In this particular example, we will find Digital Us, and from there we can glean even close associates uh, that are the co-founders of this company. You'll notice that the people identified here are also were mentioned before. In addition to this, we start getting into more detailed information, including my birthday, my birth city, and my current address. Again, we could continue the process with my address to identify um, other family members that have lived there. We can go into additional sources, but you have clearly had a, a close glimpse into the amount of data that one can find by simply looking at publicly available sources. I like to think of this as the guess who game uh, we had when we were kids. If you remember in this game, you would have a person that you would need to identify and ask questions. When we're doing the when we're doing uh, the data acquisition process in open source intelligence, we're essentially asking questions so we can discard candidates in our hunt for information. So every new public for a source of information allows you to discard another set of characters. Now, of course, uh, OSINT is traditionally been used by cybersecurity um, agents, mainly trying to map the attack surface of an organization or its employers. But more recently, it has had success with law enforcement and with financial analysts. In fact, uh, this has already explicitly been mentioned in the um, guidelines for anti-money laundering by the European Bank Association and the Financial Action Task Force, who explicitly ask for performing internet searches on open source uh, intelligence. But of course, um, this does not come without its own challenges. The process of acquiring this data tends to be a manual work and requires a lot of attention in order to determine which sources are actually describing the person we are looking at. So there are some techniques that can be used to facilitate this, uh, such as natural language processing, artificial intelligence, and above all, entity resolution. But to this day, at the very end, there should always be a human in the loop to finalize and verify with their expertise. And I'd like to point out that based on my personal experience, artificial intelligence is getting better at recognizing faces than at least my university students at the last uh, uh, alumni meeting. And yes, that is me. The second challenge is actually identifying what information is relevant. As you're probably all aware, the internet is messy, the internet is unstructured, and it's noisy. What we are looking for is that little nugget that allows us to verify that this belongs to the individual in question, and we can use it to proceed to collect further amounts of data. Now, there are, there are a main problem, which is uh, deciding which sources we can be reliant upon. And there is a paradox here on what we expect to be trustworthy and what actually is. As an example here, when you tell someone that you have found personal information on someone on their Wikipedia page, the usual response is, ah, anyone can edit Wikipedia, who cares? But if you actually go through the history, uh, what is known as conflict of interest editing has already occurred. Politicians trying to embellish their own pages and change facts. But this has always been discovered and changed by a, what can be described as crowdsourcing of journalists and users. By having this army of uh, individuals verifying that the data is truthful, you can actually have guidelines in place. On the other hand, uh, another source that you would expect to be fully reliable, like the world leaders list of the CIA, which they explicitly mention in their website that gets updated on a weekly basis, to this day, if you look in the Luxembourg uh, information, you will find ministers that haven't been updated for over a year and a half. And of course, there is still the, con the topic of uh, GDPR and protection. When you're dealing with, um, with KYC processes and utilizing open source intelligence, um, you already have the legal obligation or at least the legitimate interest to acquire this data. But this does not mean that you can freely download it and use it as you will. There are certain principles that have been recommended by the GDPR, it's particularly in the Article 5, to actually treat and deal with these issues. 
For example, data integrity establishes that if you're downloading the data, just because it has been available openly does not mean that you can distribute it openly. You have to secure it and make sure that nobody has access for it has been used for a specific goal. With data transparency, you need to be able to determine how a data point was actually acquired. So if I provide, for example, the birth date, as you saw in my previous example, I need to be able to state I recognized this uh, date by finding the link in the business register and identifying him through their name. And finally, there is the concept of data minimalization. This traditionally deals with the issue of how much data should we get and how important is it to actually acquire it. I will give an example here of how the data can actually diverge. If I was trying to establish connections between individuals, social media, uh, think for example of friendship relationships on Facebook, uh, professional collaborations on LinkedIn, these are all graphs that connect people. Uh, but another example of this would be a non-conventional source such as uh, Spotify, which contains information about people who follow your music. Now, the data of the songs that you listen to has no value uh, to your uh, due diligence. However, the establishment of a link between two known entities does. So by being able to determine which data is relevant, in this particular case, the connections, and which one isn't, the music that you listen to, you're able to deal with the data in a manner that you only obtain what you need, but only what is sufficient. Now, in order to tackle all of these uh, challenges and many more, uh, Digital Us launched over a year ago as a spin-off of the University of Luxembourg. We were initially funded by the Luxembourg National Research Fund in order to see if we could build a proof of concept to tackle all of these questions. We are currently hosted at the University of Luxembourg Incubator and we have developed a prototype alongside our partners. If any of you wish to actually join our platform and test it, uh, you are more than welcome. And I can only apologize for talking so fast, so thank you. Four experts will be joining us on stage for a roundtable entitled AML KYC Digitalization Challenges and Opportunities. So Raoul Mulheims, co-founder and CEO of Phenology and co-founder of Ampulse, will be the moderator. And in this frame, let's welcome Glenn Meyer. I saw him in the room already. Yeah. Hello, Glenn. Glenn Meyer, lawyer and partner at Aaron and Medanach, Pascal Bougain, Chief Operations and Compliance Officer of La Mondiale Europartner, and Max Brown, Head of the FIU Luxembourg. So, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Okay, good. Good afternoon. Uh, so, for this session on uh, KYC AML with uh, a few distinguished uh, speakers here, so also taking into account, and thank you for this kind of introduction, Nadia, of course. So given the topic we're going to be uh, touching base on today, so the, the fight against money laundering has been a, a growing concern for, 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 for quite some time now. So last year, also the fifth AML directive has been transposed into national law in Luxembourg, and so the national regulators have adopted the circulars and uh, that update this framework and also the regulation uh, and changed some of the rules here and also they introduced some new opportunities and additional flexibility uh, for Luxembourg regulated entities. Also taking into account that Luxembourg is, let's say, a very specific financial center and has a very specific financial industry, of course, also compared to some other markets there. So there have been uh, some additional choices also for the players that are based in Luxembourg. Huh? So first, there is a, a risk-based approach that has been introduced and has become the norm in this sense also. Also with regards to customer due diligence measures, now for some players would say, finally, there has been a, the concept of automation has been introduced but still pending some guidelines and regulation also that is still uh, that hasn't been published yet. So we are waiting for this. Um, also, there has been additional clarification on simplified and enhanced due diligence uh, on the relationships with PAPs and so on, and also on due diligence requirements, uh, further strengthening uh, these. And uh, finally, also outsourcing requirements and governance requirements have, have also been reviewed. So today's discussion will be 
about how to deal with this regulation, with the changes that we have seen over the last uh, over the last year, but also about the general uh, the general setting setup we have in Luxembourg. Uh, also, what are the challenges here? What are the opportunities? How to deal with these? And from different perspectives, also by our speakers um, that can cover this ground actually from their backgrounds, which are really different, we found out also in the preparation talks also, uh, which give, will give some additional uh, spice maybe also to this discussion. So when preparing this discussion, we uh, thought about covering, from two, uh, covering it from two angles. So on one side, how do digital strategies enhance, improve, change policies, procedures, and setups? At a variety of levels also for financial industry players, so the impact of digital strategies on the, on the other side, what are the best practices, the lessons learned, the do's and don'ts that the players on the market can, can actually share and also to bring added value to you, to the audience, both in the room and uh, remotely, uh, also to, to share with you some of the uh, uh, some of the lessons, some of the uh, the best practices also that we see on the market. So both to tackle what are the challenges, but also to give some advice on the other side. Of course, we cannot be exhaustive today, uh, given the uh, uh, the vast context of KYC and AML, what it has grown into, let's say, for the complexity of the topic, we'll all only be able to tackle some of the aspects today. So <laughs> excuse us in advance in this sense for not being comprehensive today, but we'll try to, uh, to dig a little bit deeper on some of the topics, of course. So for the introduction of our distinguished speakers uh, in the panel, so first to, to my left here, uh, we have Max Braun, who is the uh, head of the Luxembourg FAU. FIU, the Salut de Renseignement Financier. And also he, he, he will be able to, to share some of the insight and recommendations from the perspective of the Luxembourg Financial Intelligence Unit. Hmm. Then we have uh, Pascal Bugin, huh? so who's, let's say, representing the industry <laughs> in this sense. So, so who's Chief Operations and Compliance Officer at uh, La Mondiale Euro Partner. So one of Luxembourg's leading uh, life insurance companies, I think last year has grown into the number two on the market. Yeah, good. Congratulations on that. So to share the views of uh, one of the key players of the, of the Luxembourg uh, life insurance space, which is a very particular one, but Pascal uh, can share a little bit more about this. And then finally, uh, last but not least, of course, I have to say Glenn Meyer, who is a lawyer and partner at Arendt and Medanach, Luxembourg, Luxembourg's biggest law firm and to provide us with, hopefully, with some of the insights about uh, what his clients are facing as challenges today and how they are dealing with these, uh, with these topics. Okay, so let's jump into it right away. Uh, first, about the selection of topics. So, um, Pascal, maybe let's start with the industry's view. What, what would be the, the main concerns that you have today, the main challenges that you are facing? But also on the other side, maybe you can share some of the, uh, the lessons you have learned in this context and also how you tackled these and what you uh, would recommend to other players in the industry on how to improve and how to, uh, how to deal with these situations. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. So I think the, the main challenge we have is to face with the... Uh, increasing complexity of the AML due diligence, and especially the tax compliance. I think today our compliance team uh, has some tough time really to understand exactly the scheme and the tax, in fact, aspect on the scheme with uh, our clients, and also to find the right document to evidence uh, the scheme. So if you look at the different market, it's quite difficult to find the same in fact, documentation. So it's very a long time for them. So the decision was to focus them on those aspects because we know that this is uh, what uh, is important today and then uh, the regulator are looking for. And so we, we had to find solution to gain time on the other task. And so we decided to have uh, the use of uh, your platform to digitalize some aspect of the uh, KYC and IML just to make sure that our team, our compliance team, are main focused on the would say human analysis. So that's really what we did. And the second challenge we have to face is today 
we see that we have also some difficulty to have access to the supposed public uh, data. If you look only to the register of uh, economic beneficiary, it's roughly impossible for a Luxembourg carrier to have access to the French, Italian, German register. Or when you have access, it's partial. And if you have access, you can never put uh, a connection. So it's a manual check. So that's really for us the two main challenge we have today. And that's why we were, we have decided to use uh, digitalization. Okay, so if I may sum up, so did one challenge would be actually to grow into tax experts to a certain extent where you need to understand the underlying uh, product way deeper also from a tax perspective. And on the other side, indeed, uh, then the, the answer you brought to this context was to, uh, to actually to, to focus more on the other side on digitization of the processes in order to have more resources actually to allocate to the to the main challenge. So, so um, um, and the access to the registers, of course, that's something I suppose that over time is going to be, I wouldn't say solved, but enhanced also from a general perspective also to make sure that um, all the players in the market will be able to, to deal with this properly. Um, if I may just jump in, maybe Glenn, from your perspective, when, uh, when you see your clients, are these concerns that are maybe shared? Is it something that that you see very often uh, also that gets that gets referred to what what is your idea about uh, about these challenges well uh, Raul, uh, i would say it, it it's a bit different and in the same time it's a bit shared concern aml generally speaking is a shared concern because it's a, it's a material that is very important it's criminally sanctioned so of course there is material exposure so um, when it comes now to the digitalization uh, need, there is growing demand for this. I mean, we should embrace it, and it's a very important uh, feature for the future. A, I mean, AML is a material that lives within its own society. The society is a gr at a growing pace, more and more occupied, by millennials and even newer generations that hardly do the physical stuff anymore, if I may call it that way. So first, it's a growing demand for that. Second, I mean, all authorities basically embrace it. So, I mean, it would allow you to lift the risk-based approach at the new pace because it allows you to focus your stuff on actually tasks which really require a more analytical type of work where perhaps the digital or the tech is not yet available and to less focus your stuff on more, let's say, easier manageable aspects of the KYC initial gathering. The first difficulty that most of our clients give us at least to thought about is to say, but we cannot find really the once for all solution. Uh, and I think whenever there is a paradigm change in society, there is an adaptation period. I mean, there are plenty of papers of FATF that really encourages this and embraces this digitalization. The problem is, who is willing to come forward with a solution that basically um, serves its purpose and it's kind of labeled as tested? Because in going into that way, without having something that actually works, creates a correlative exposure that is of criminal nature. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I believe that there is a certain reluctance. There is will, there is material interest, but there is, in achieving the goal, reluctance in trying to get it because on the market yet, there is nothing that really d allows you to get a full one-stop shop for this. So this might also be in a classic chicken and the egg problem then in this sense also. You remember, that so was basically the words that I used yesterday, said it's a chicken and an egg problem. So yeah. I think what is important, but there is also a do that I strongly support in this is that authorities are quite supportive of that. And I think it's very, very important that be it forums, informal or formal, whatever their shape and form, it's very important that these discussions take place and that you can though you cannot expect of authorities to get a vetting of a solution, that at least you can actively discuss them to see whether it at least goes in the right direction. At the end of the day, you take the risk, 
So you have to take the responsibility for this as well. But I think that would induce and further bolster a, a, a trend towards using it at a quicker pace than it's supposed to be. Um, but there is one challenge, and we lawyers are very well known to always identify issues and less perspectives, uh, but this challenge is nevertheless important to bear in mind. One must not be completely naive. Even if you find a solution that helps you in gathering, for instance, the AML component of an onboarding stage, one must not forget we are at the financial sector that is very complex and that is subject to multiple different layers of regulations. And AML is just one part, it's perhaps a bigger part of the iceberg of data that has to be collected. But there is MIFI, common reportings, and FATCA, there are so many others. So I think it's also important to get a global picture and to try to approach it from a holistic perspective. The solution will have to be able to also embrace a gathering of data that is not only about AML. Otherwise, the recourse to that might be more difficult. Okay. Um, Max, from your perspective, and uh, when preparing this discussion, you, um, uh, you pointed out one of the angles where you were saying, I would really like to encourage players uh, to focus on the quality of the files they, that they submit. And this, I think, um, was, was one of the aspects that, that you, you just right now pointed out also. So w what is it you're facing today from, from your perspective, from the authorities' perspective? I, don't, I do know that you don't make the rules. You apply them, of course, so it's a different, uh, a different angle here. But on the other side, what, what do you see? What, is, what are the concerns? What would be uh, the, the challenges, the main challenges that you see on today's market? Well, from, from our perspective as FIU, of course, we receive the reports from, uh, from the private sector. Uh, so we rely on the quality of the information uh, well, that, is, uh, that can be found uh, in these reports. I think that the first element that is important is the standardization of the information. If reporting entities are not able to standardize their information, are not able uh, to structure their information, then they, have, then they face difficulties also to check the accuracy uh, of, uh, of, of this information. And when we are talking about the onboarding process, today it is possible to automate certain checks to check uh, the accuracy of the data with regard uh, to, to, to business registers, perhaps in the future also with regard to the beneficial owner uh, register and so on. So there are quite some, some possibilities, there are quite some, um, well, we, we, we see that there are, that technology will enable uh, companies to implement solutions that will really uh, well, provide the company with good, with qualitative data, with, with good uh, information. And we also rely on this because if we receive information of bad quality, well, we can't really conduct uh, in, well, a productive uh, analysis. Something that I want to highlight is really the quality of the transaction monitoring that is being conducted by, uh, by certain entities. We are talking here about entities that actually have a lot of data, data available. We are talking about uh, e-money institutions or payment institutions. But well, they have lots of data and they are today able to analyze this data and to provide us with very high quality SDRs. As an example, years ago, we received like 10 reports a year on, uh, on child pornography or uh, on uh, human trafficking because it was actually very difficult to detect this. Mm -hmm. You don't really find uh, a lot of information that is publicly available on people uh, that, uh, that are abusing children and so on. But today what we can see is that very complex algorithms analyze the transactions and can link certain people to uh, child sexual abuse 
or to human trafficking just by analyzing the transactions. And I have to say this is really impressive and this really helps the authorities also to catch these people. Um, last year we had quite a number of success stories with Europol on these very specific aspects of money laundering. Uh, and yes, it's, it's something that has been that is possible because of the evaluation uh, of data processing mm -hmm. and analysis tools. Yeah, but as you pointed out, um, I think it's it's mostly relevant in contexts where there's actually, um, let's say, substantial vast amounts of data that is available. Otherwise, I mean, and this this, I think also let's say from the technical provider's perspective. So I'm just uh, integrating in my personal <laughs> view in this sense. Um, it's a uh, it's a matter of a kind of you have a distinction in the financial industry and lots in between, of course, between on one side that you have, let's say, the classic wealth management, private banking uh, businesses. And on the other side, you have, as we do have some in Luxembourg, uh, to get the companies, the, the payment institutions and uh, money institutions, for instance, that manage huge amounts of, of, of transactions. So... Um, also, what would you say, where, where, where does it, okay, it can compensate potentially if you invest a little bit more on the uh, transaction analysis based on quantitative data, but on the other side, um, where comes the quality in and also with regards to, let's say, complex transactions where a private bank uh, working as a, let's say, an extended family office in a sense more, which uh, is the case for many banks here, they know intimately what their clients are doing. And um, also how to, to manage this and how do you see from the perspective of the Luxembourg financial industry and the financial center, the both of them. We, are we facing two challenges or is it really the same, but just under different, from different perspectives? I know it's a complex question in this sense, of course. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I, I think that today information is, is quite ac accessible. It's getting more and more accessible and this enables all sectors actually to, to gather relevant and accurate information. Something that we should never forget, even with the best technology, we should, should never forget our just common sense. And just have a look at the whole client relationship. Does it make sense or doesn't it make any sense? I could give you a lot of examples. But just imagine you have your system that identified a person as being a PEP and, and so on. So this, the IT solution worked well and helped you to identify this person correctly. But still this PEP wants to invest 5 million euros in Luxembourg and explains that this is his salary. Well, there, just, there, are some, yeah. there, is, there, may, there, there may be a problem here. Because as a PAP, earning 5 million euros from your salary as PAP is still quite unlikely. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. Perhaps there are other sources of wealth and so on. But for sure, it's not enough just to, kick, to, to, to tick the box salary. You need more explanations. And I think that even with the best technology, you should never forget just your common sense. This requires the humans indeed to be in the process to a certain extent because AI can't really deal with this, of course. I mean, that makes sense. And then also that, uh, getting back to your statement in the beginning that the human in the process can focus on the tasks that are not machine work to do. And I think this is also what we see today more and more company or the compliance team specializing and uh, investing on the intelligent work or the smart work to do and to come up with better results than instead of just ticking boxes, uh, as you pointed out. You remember one of my uh, comments earlier on where I said, this allows you to lift the risk-based approach, perhaps in a more efficient way. You can focus your stuff on tasks that actually require more human intervention, perhaps more sophisticated analytical type of work, as opposed to uh, having to devote all your resources across all the stages of the KYC. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Brown's example uh, uh, two minutes ago is quite illustrative. I mean, we, we're talking about the stage where you simply gather standardized data, 
then you have to do something with the data, which is a bit to verify that and to foolproof that perhaps also from a content perspective. And then you start to serve a client through a lifetime. A wealth manager will probably have a lifetime history knowledge of his client as opposed to perhaps a, a more retail-oriented service provider. But then they do that profiling, then they do that matching. Does that serve the purpose? Does it make sense? Is there a common sense of that? And I think we will have to see that the first stage will become more and more digitalized quickly. And actually, uh, I was a bit lawyerish earlier on. There are already some partial solutions. Nespar, Raoul, you know them uh, for the first Thanks stage. For the but but uh, then it's the second stage. And I think these are the performing algorithm that allow you to make these behavioral checks. And that will also become machine learning. And, and therefore, they will become more and more sophisticated. But I have to recognize one thing, and, and then I'm going to... Uh, shut up as a lawyer. I always talk too much. But I, I do have a certain sympathy for the point of tax compliance. That is a, a type of domain. It's a subset now of AML related due diligence, but it is extraordinarily complex. And Luxembourg is a very successful international financial sector, and the clients it serves partially also involves multiple, multiple layer structures where these types of, let's say, uh, exercises of doing your due deal becomes uh, like a deep dive into many complex elements where it would probably take years and years for sophisticated algorithm to produce an effective result. Also with a, a changing regulation at this end and also being, well, at least for much of the tax regulation being in national law still and so on, and this has to be taken into account with all the jurisdictions that that the players on the Luxembourg financial industry have to deal with. So, okay, let's move on. We have six minutes left here, according to the counter. So let's move on to the uh, to the last part of our discussion, where I asked uh, uh, the panelists to uh, yeah to share some recommendations. Let's say also with uh, with the industry, with the audience, also what they would recommend if they could point out one or two uh, core. Uh, lessons learned, recommendations, things to do, do's and don'ts, whatever. So what would it be? Uh, so maybe, Pascal, we can start with you. Okay. Maybe the first one is to say, don't wait, and we have already said that, don't wait for the full digital process. I think the magic tool doesn't exist. But let's use the digitalization as a support. I think today we can have uh, support from uh, different platforms, different solutions to do some basic control and let our people uh, remain focused on the uh, really human analysis. And the second one is don't forget that you have human, human behind that. So when you start to work on a digitalization, let's uh, do that in cooperation first with your partner to understand their needs and the client expectation to make sure that when you put a product on the market, you meet the expectation of your clients. And the second one is with the fintech. Because at the end of the day, of course, they will provide you with the technology and so on. But at the end of the day, you are responsible. So I think you should be clear with the fintech that this is the rule. We are responsible for that. You do the tech side. And at the end, I think we will be, uh, it will be a win-win solution. From the fintech perspective, I can confirm this. And also the regulator are heavily insisting on that point. And also it's always the regulated entity that remains liable and responsible for the implementation, which, of course, makes a lot of sense. Max, for your recommendations, you refer to the common sense, maybe dig a little bit deeper, or what, what else would you tell, let's say, uh, the, 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 the companies, the, the, the regulated entities that are reporting to you? Also, what, what could they do better? What should they, what should they avoid? Is there any, anything you would really like to share with them? Well, we, we were talking a lot about uh, the risk-based uh, approach. When it comes to the, to the filing process, to the FIU, there is actually no risk-based approach. You are obliged to report to the FIU as soon as you have a suspicion of money laundering or terrorist financing. This means that we are receiving a lot of reports. We are talking about 40 to 50,000 uh, reports per year. And we really rely on the quality of the data that we are receiving. If we are receiving bad quality of data, our systems are not 
able to analyze this information correctly. We actually, we are using a 100% electronic system for the reception of all the SDRs and every other piece of information, uh, which is called GoML, by the way. And, well, we can configure this system. We can automate a lot of processes. We can also, we are also implementing a risk-based approach at the yep. FIU. But if the quality of the data is very low, then all these systems at the end of the day don't work. And at the end of the day, the whole process is not efficient at all because, well, we have two alternatives. Either hiring people to analyze all these reports that are not very relevant, or we just, <laughs> well, put them into our database and we do uh, some uh, information exchanges and so on. But, well, as the information is not very qualitative, at the end of the day, the whole process still is not very effective. So I can only invite you to really care for the data quality. And of course, for your internal analysis, without such qualitative information, you can also not conduct uh, yes, your analysis. Yeah, proper Correct. investigations, I guess, indeed, say there's an economy of scale of actually also for the internal <laughs> purposes and needs. Uh, and uh, yeah, the shared, shared interest. Glenn, your recommendations of oh, being, I don't know, a little bit more than 20 years in this area also, and so being an expert here, what, what would you say today? Uh, the players, your clients, what, what should they what should they more focus a little more on? It's difficult because they have so much to focus on. So uh, I, I'll try to limit it to, to let's say the, the basic um, key elements. First, everyone is agreeing on the panel that the legislation has become extremely complex. It is uh, also um, shared on multiple supports, which makes the reading and the knowledge and expertise thereof more complicated than it used to be. So as a lawyer, it will come as no surprise that I would say, take the time to read that carefully. You must engage with your partner when building the digital solution to make sure that this probably costs a lot of money, a lot of time and energy, that at least for the stages where you will start having a digitalization, you will use it to the fullest extent so that you have limited exposure. That would be first thing. And then perhaps also uh, another idea, um, try to make sure that you don't miss out on data. Very often we see uh, a comprehensive approach. Uh, they went all the way, they collected everything, but they don't act upon what they have. Uh, I mean, uh, when we prepared the panel, we, we, I, I believe we, we used one of the examples where they have basically supporting evidence for all stages of the KYC. Well, when you look through the evidence, you start noticing that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Max was referring to the common sense idea. My ingredient would be just using what at least you are obliged to have and make sure that the solution, wherever stage you build it, it exploits and uses the data that you have. And with a lot of data also externally becoming available, try to that the, the algorithm uh, cross matches this mm -hmm. and uses that behavior component whether you're in wealth management or in private banking or whether you're more like a neo kind of actor whatever the more sophisticated the, the algorithms becomes the more sophisticated the outcome would become and therefore contributing to more higher quality suspicious activity reports yeah. last element very very last element uh, in a perfect world, we would be able to concentrate more on the qualitative type of, uh, let's say, reports and more analytical types of tasks in the KYC. The problem is the material has become so um, vast that it also is very much rule-based. So, and I per probably that also explains to some extent a certain reluctancy to use these uh, uh, resources and softwares perhaps at the pace that everyone would love to have it, which is also this, you miss out on this, you're already creating an exposure for yourself. And I think finding the right balance there is extremely difficult at this stage. Thank you for sharing. 
I mean, I'm not going to do a huge wrap up since time has run up here. Just a forecast for maybe a next panel because we spent one and a half hours actually on the call yesterday discussing many aspects and there's lots of grounds that could be covered here actually, I think, which is uh, which could be very interesting also to share and to have a debate about it. Also data sharing among players, encouraging them to do so, creating the right framework and the right rules and actually and uh, the policies that go with it also and giving the incentives is one of the, yeah, I'd say one of the main challenges. And since we have been discussing about this, uh, about data issues, let's say at the player's individual level, also the sharing might be then one very interesting topic to cover for our next panel. Thank you for listening to the explanations. Thank you, gentlemen, for contributing. Bye-bye. Thank you, Raoul, Glenn, Pascal, and Max for the very interesting and engaging discussion. Thank you. So the next imp interesting discussion will be on the growing interest towards a centralized KYC, ongoing due diligence process outsourcing, relying on the secured client data mutualization. It will be hosted by Fernand Lepage, Director KYC Office of BGL BNB Paribas, and Pascal Morosini, CEO of IHUB, IHUB offers managed services for the maintenance of KYC files related to natural persons and legal entities. Please welcome them on stage. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Nadia, for the kind introduction. So, uh, my name is Pascal Amorosini. I'm the um, CEO of IHUB the uh, KYC due diligence outsourcing solution made in Luxembourg. And uh, actually to introduce that discussion, uh, you've heard uh, on the previous panel, but you know also on the market, you have several ways to actually increase the data quality of, of your files uh, and do your, your due diligence periodic reviews. Either actually you can buy a software that you have to operate yourself with your team, with your back office internally, you can, of course, um, use external data providers and uh, increase the, the quality or at least the, uh, the volumes of the data within your system that you will still have to check, of course. Uh, or you can grow your staff you know, and uh, just add people to compensate uh, the, the potentially uh, the lack of system automation. And you can have potentially another solution, which is the outsourcing. So in terms of outsourcing, um, five years ago, Post Group decided to create iHub based on the uh, Luxembourg uh, financial market request, a long dated request, uh, a dream of the market to, to have a, a unique central uh, KYC uh, uh, utility, uh, which, is, which is finally uh, happened with uh, iHub. So we launched uh, iHub in 2016. We went into production in December 2019. Uh, and since then, we are operating uh, here in Luxembourg the, the KYC centralized uh, utility. Uh, today, uh, on stage with me, I have the pleasure to have Fernand Lepage. Fernand Lepage who is the director of the KYC office of BGL BNP Paribas. Uh, BGL BNP Paribas, who is also a shareholder of, of IUB and who has decided to invest in the uh, outsourcing uh, solution. So I guess my first question to uh, uh, Fernand is, but why did you, from all the solutions available on the market, why did you finally decide to actually uh, choose the outsourcing uh, solution as uh, an additional tool to help uh, you doing the uh, review of the KYC files? Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, being here. So effectively, why did we choose IUB and the outsourcing solution? Indeed, uh, as you already said, uh, we have um, a growing... Um, regulatory uh, changes. We have also a lot of um, client needs and we also have a lot of needs of data automation, data gathering. And today doing it ourselves is one option, as you said. But the other option is why don't we trust an utility who can help us? We integrate it in our process. So when we speak about outsourcing, we don't outsource the compliance department. We don't outsource our uh, relationship managers. We only uh, try to get the data of our clients, the more fresh possible and the most reliant possible. And so we think that's not the core business of a bank. 
the core business of the bank is to analyze the data, to analyze the risk of the data, and to take its decision if yes or no, the bank wants to work with that client. On the other side, we can trust a utility who has the best in class, that's what we think, what we believe, uh, tools to exploit the data and to give it to us, and we can trust to the quality of the data. And uh, what is important is um, the data belongs to the client, not to the bank. So that's often forgotten. And so a lot of clients complain uh, in, in front of me. Yes, uh, last week it was uh, your ENG who asked me for document. Last month it was the bill who asked me for document. Now you ask me the same document. It has a different color, but the content is the same. And so why can't I put it somewhere and to take it yourself? And that's a little bit what we try to do with IUB. So And that's why we believe in that solution. And then by this, you, you pointing or you touching on centralization, mutualization, we will come back on, on, on that before. Um, but yes, but why taking that decision? I'm sure internally you had faced, uh, uh, well, barriers or, or people saying, well, Fernand, you're going to be outsourcing uh, our, old client, our old client book uh, to an external company. I mean, this has a risk. Uh, this is, uh, uh, from a security point of view, this, this has not been a, an easy discussion. How did you cope with that discussion of, of the outsourcing of one of your, the most precious thing of a bank, which is his uh, client books? Indeed, you're right. Uh, the first reactions of some people, not all, in, uh, effectively, you were a little bit, uh, wow, uh, now you are really crazy. You, 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 you give the data out of the bank, you put it on the plateau for the others, and at the end, the hackers can get the information of all the clients in Luxembourg. That was reactions of some people. Let's say uh, other people had a different reaction. Oh, that's nice for the client. How, how can I say? It's a question of trust uh, the most. And security is now the most biggest point of trust. Uh, what I must say, we did an, a big due diligence on IUB ourselves before we entered into a relationship with them. Uh, I say operationally now, not uh, from the capital point of view. And we did an audit on your system with an external company specialized in cybersecurity, and they did not find any major findings regarding the security. And uh, now you are 27001, I think, uh, on the certification. For me, uh, that's a good trust. What I also must say, it's based in Luxembourg. So the data is, in that case, anyway, just next to us, because also the bank have their backup systems also in outside systems. And they have also uh, the, um, the accreditation from the CSSF. So they are like we are, in fact. So why don't we trust them? So for us, that was a big point, this question of trust. And also for the clients, I think the fact that they know that the data is still uh, hosted in Luxembourg is a, a big point. And also managed in Luxembourg. As a, as a, as a startup, the, the take-up was, um, I mean, we had to build a system from scratch. But also we had to deal with the fact that we are PFS and that we also had to... Uh, uh, to set up from an organization point of view, from a governance point of view, all the uh, uh, what you need to be a PFS from a compliance uh, point of view. And so therefore, this has also gained trust to our system, whereby uh, nowadays uh, when talking to banks, we don't have such a discussion about, uh, okay, uh, is it secure to outsource our client book to us, uh, to you? Uh, and uh, are you secure enough uh, in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of uh, data holding and, and so on? And from the very big beginning the prerequisite of the, the construction of the outsourcing solution uh, I, uh, so within IUB, uh, the decision was taken actually to host the data at EBRC here in Luxembourg, uh, so to have a strong data residency here in Luxembourg, to have of, of course a security operations center around it with a, a red team, a blue team, making sure actually uh, uh, that we avoid uh, cyber attacks. Uh, but also what was very important for BGL, BNP Paribas, but for some of our other clients like Post Finance and other banks to come, uh, was the uh, business continuity. So we also have a, a business continuity in place to make sure that actually uh, we can continue servicing our clients uh, as, we, as, we, as we are servicing uh, them uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, uh, very interesting you, because you mentioned about uh, those people having to uh, uh, do the updates uh, whenever they are, uh, they are a natural person or legal entities uh, with with all the different banks, the insurance company as well, and another type of uh, uh, business uh, relationship. 
yeah, it was key uh, at the outsourcing and centralized solution uh, to offer the, the mutualization or, or sharing of, of files. And this is not an easy one. Uh, of course, in conferences like that, people can talk about mutualization and so on. Uh, those words are easy to pronounce, but I can tell you to put this in music, it's quite tough. Uh, but we did it. Uh, and now, uh, nowadays, uh, what we can do in our system is that we respect the risk-based approach of each of our clients, but at the same time, uh, we can share, based on the consent, of course, of the final client, we can share the information between the banks, uh, again, if the end client has, has, has allowed us to do so. In terms of legal entity, uh, it's different uh, because everything which is public, uh, you can share. Uh, you have, of course, a barrier at the uh, related party, so the natural person, which are linked to the legal entities, whereby you fall under the GDPR again. Uh, and there, we also ask the consent of the legal entity uh, to share whenever it's the ID card of the proof of residence of the directors or the UBOs uh, and so on. Uh, but we thought uh, of, of course, how to mutualize uh, the different documents uh, but also how to uh, uh, manage the revocation of uh, the consent. And so when you have to put that in music in the system, uh, when I'm saying it's not an easy one, it costs us a lot of uh, business analysis uh, and a lot of uh, thoughts, but uh, we are there uh, uh, right now. Also, in terms of data quality and automation, I heard from the panel before uh, that uh, it's tough uh, to get the UBOs. Uh, yes, it is, but uh, we have invested heavily in technologies, and today we can manage uh, the automation of uh, uh, UBOs and uh, the gathering uh, of data from 10 different uh, trade registers, uh, mainly in Europe, in, in the UK uh, as well. And uh, it's easy for us to add a new uh, jurisdiction in order to automatically get the documentation. So when you don't have the APIs to gather the UBOs, you have to go the difficult way. And the difficult way is to actually buy each of the documentation uh, regarding a company, run machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, and actually extract uh, who the UBOs are. And, and that we do. Waiting for some of the jurisdiction, for example, like Luxembourg, op open ups and make the APIs uh, available for more structured uh, automation. But actually, technology is there, and uh, uh, we use it heavily in order to automatically uh, update uh, the files. Uh, another remarks from the gentleman from uh, Arendt and Merdenach on the uh, previous panel was regarding there was no, there was no one magic, uh, one-stop shop, one-stop solution. I, I agree. We had to make some choices uh, in terms of uh, the scope of the, the, the KYC uh, data. Uh, we had decided, of course, on your request uh, to also manage level one and level two uh, for FATCA and CRS. Uh, but of course, uh, we had to, st to, to stop there at, at, some, st at some stage. You, you can't offer everything in, into one solution. For example, we don't do MIFID, but we, we could potentially do it. Uh, and this is also uh, from one of the panelists uh, uh, earlier uh, this afternoon. I heard that uh, sometimes uh, customers, I'm not talking about you, but some others are looking for the magic solution that can do everything, and that does not exist. I have an example in the fund industry whereby uh, suddenly we had to do a digital identity, creating a, a front-end portal for the clients, do the KYC uh, due diligence, uh, the MIFID, the, the FATCA CRS, and, and, all, and all the rest. Okay. Uh, uh, this takes time to build, uh, uh, and of course we can potentially add those modules, but it takes it takes time. For the for the moment, we have decided to remain within the KYC due diligence um, uh, uh, approach. Now, coming back on what is one of the key uh, advantage of the centralized KYC repository made in Luxembourg, based in Luxembourg, is centralization and mutualization. How was this aspect of being able to mutualize um, or allow the mutualization of the file of your clients with your competitor? And I remember in our early discussion, uh, uh, Fernand, uh, that you said once, and this helped me a lot uh, when I went to Germany and France in front of the La Banque Postale, uh, Société Générale, or uh, Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank, you know, the giant who are looks, looking themselves as, as, as competitors, you said, we don't compete on KYC. So, so, so my question is, yeah, how 
in your outsourcing de decision, the centralization and mutualization was key. And is this, we don't compete on KYC uh, anymore. Is it, is it, is it true? Uh, is it still true? Sorry. Yeah. Let's say the client, uh, we must be client oriented. If we just try to, to monopolize him on our administrative tasks, it's clear he loses time, we lose time, and everybody loses time. So for the KYC, for me, is a regulatory obligation. It's important to have the information also for other processes, for reporting and any else. But in the end, the client, he, if I take the companies, they have in each bank an account in Luxembourg, in the retail banks. So. We don't compete on that point. We compete on the products. We compete on our services, on the credits, but not on the data and the documents he gives to us. The more fast he can do it, the better it is for us. And so if he can replicate the documents already given previously to IEB and then to us, it's easier for us. And something that is very important, the regulator wants that we actualize permanently our files. That's something we could invest ourselves, buy technology, do it ourselves, do it our own, ask the client our own, the things, but if we centralize it, it will be faster, quicker, and probably more efficient. And that's what we try to do. So the competition is not, are we doing better the KYC than the others? The competition is more, are we able to um, to help the client to go faster in his, uh, in his processing? And that's why centralization is key, because the clients, they want to put their information somewhere, and everybody takes it instead of putting it five times in a different way. That's how we think we feel competition, not the other way around. And you see, this is this is great. This is the openness of, of the Luxembourg market towards to say, with the honesty to say, we don't compete on KYC, let's do something together. And uh, if I recall one of the survey of the ABBL from uh, November 2019, uh, you had on top, uh, uh, the question was, uh, what would you like uh, to, to, to mutualize in terms of function? Regulatory re reporting were, were coming once uh, first, and then you had KYC and AML. And I think that that speaks Spirit, that's, that, that, that state of mind is really great so that it pushes us to actually uh, cooperate much more uh, uh, together. And I had the same now uh, uh, reflection and the same, uh, 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 yes, uh, um, uh, opinion from uh, some of the uh, uh, transfer agents who are now willing to build together in order to help the financial market uh, being at the top. Uh, especially for the fund industry, rather than actually uh, either developing themselves or investing in technology themselves, but more investing into uh, the centralized uh, utility. If I, if I can, uh, sorry, if I can add one point, there are a lot of solutions internationally, like Swift, like others, who offer that already. The difference of IHUB is that if the data is sent to us, it's checked against quality and uh, and completeness. What is not the case on the others, and that's a big point for us. That's why the centralization works also, because we can trust what we receive. And we, does, we don't need to recheck it a second time. Thanks for that, Fernand. We were told not to do advertising, but thank you very much. Um, yes, this, I can see that time, our time is out. So uh, maybe uh, a few seconds for, for a few questions. Any questions from the audience on the outsourcing solution? Don't be shy. No questions. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Fernand. Thank you. Thank you. Merci, Fernand. Merci, Pascal. Uh, I fully agree with your insights, and uh, thank you for coming. The last intervention is offered in collaboration with the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Offices to connect with entrepreneurs worldwide. In this framework, I am pleased to invite on stage Frederick Becker, Project Manager at the Ministry of the Economy. Cut now. Hey, startups, did you know it's the perfect time to put Luxembourg on your radar? Propel your business to the next level in the very heart of Europe and take advantage of a fast growing startup ecosystem an international and business-friendly environment, easy access to corporate decision-makers, and public authorities with a clear digital focus. Start to build your international team now. As a company with international ambitions, being based in Luxembourg comes with quite a few benefits. Luxembourg is a very international place with people being international-minded, speaking multiple languages, but also the geographic situation offers an easy access to many European countries. 
People say you can't bring top talent into Luxembourg. You absolutely can. The small scale actually helps us bring some of the most amazing talent. And sometimes it can be way less competitive than some of the biggest European hubs. Luxembourg is your perfect gateway into European markets. So good evening uh, to, to everyone. And uh, thank you for, for, for attending this session. I know it's the last session of, uh, of, of today and, and it's the session between um, be, between the actual event and, and the, the, the fresh drinks afterwards. So thank you for, 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 for attending. So, um, this session actually will be about the, the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Offices. I'm sure some of you are aware of the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Offices, which are actually offices, uh, from Luxembourg that are spread all over the world with two main goals. One being to help you as, as entrepreneurs whenever you go abroad, uh, to the main uh, business centers in the world to to connect with them. And their, their other role is, uh, so to say, the opposite, to help companies and entrepreneurs from from uh, where, where these uh, trade offices are implemented to connect with uh, Luxembourg and, and get engaged with, uh, with Luxembourg. And that is actually what happened here with, uh, with uh, two uh, fintech companies that got in touch with one of our trade and investment office with the one in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. So there, there are two companies today, two startups that are going to pitch because that is the, the aim of the, uh, of, of the presentation. And uh, these, these startups are from Abu Dhabi and from Dubai. Also, let me point out when I, when I mentioned Dubai that, uh, that next month, uh, Dubai will be like uh, uh, for for several months, one of the, one of the centers of the world because the the World Expo uh, that was originally uh, planned in 2020 will begin in uh, in uh, in Dubai and Luxembourg will be present at the World Expo with uh, a pavilion. So just to to mention this in the context uh, of uh, uh, of our trade uh, offices. So without uh, further ado. Let me um, introduce you to the two uh, to the two companies, or they will actually uh, present uh, uh, themselves uh, to you with their solution. And the first one being Codebase with uh, uh, Emaat uh, Shirazi. So um, Emaat, the floor is is yours. If you connect it, I hope I can. Uh, you can hear us. For having me over here in uh, in Luxembourg, um, obviously connecting from Dubai, but uh, glad to be present. Um, just want to confirm that I can share my screen here. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's try. Okay. Yeah, this should work. So please, the the, the floor is yours. Uh, so again, thanks everybody for having me. Uh, we uh, special thanks to the uh, Mina FinTech Association as well as uh, ICT Spring and Farvest. Um, Cobase Technologies is uh, naturally very very happy to be included in uh, in this event along with the uh, along with other fintechs. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, let's get started. So. Uh, to introduce ourselves, uh, we are Codebase Technologies. We uh, we started back in 2017 with a with a focus on demystifying the digital financial services space, um, with expertise in the banking uh, in the banking arena, consulting arena, technology arena, um, and the Islamic banking arena. We we. We started this company to reintroduce uh, the world to the capabilities of a bank uh, to, to try to push the boundaries of what is possible. We, as you can see, are, a, uh, are an award-winning global open API banking solutions provider that collaborates with uh, banks, financial institutions, non-banking financial institutions, and essentially anybody that is trying to uh, to imbue their existing line of products and services with uh, with a financial option, um, our solution is uh, is rooted in innovation. Our organization is driven by uh, research and development, and we are uh, we are spread out all across the world, 
trying to uh, trying to push the boundary on what is possible for the banking and financial services space. Um, about our solution, we uh, our core platform is the DigiBank platform. Now, in a nutshell, the DigiBank platform is a comprehensive one-stop shop digital banking, uh, digital bank in a box solution. Uh, what that means is we have collected and developed and fine-tuned over 470 open banking ready integration APIs, uh, which are then used uh, to, uh, to be composed into any institution or uh, bank or any kind of organization. Uh, it is used to provide, provide them with, uh, with the next generation of uh, financial services capabilities. As you can see, this falls into a range of different categories. Uh, we, we have a range of proprietary onboarding, KYC and document management uh, APIs. Uh, we cover the ATM card-based transactions uh, realm. Uh, we cover basic core functionality, such as accounts and deposits. Our solution is capable of personalizations. Uh, we cover transfers and payments, loans collateral, fraud and AML, as well as logistics and uh, communication. Now, uh, one of our biggest strengths with uh, at Codebase Technologies is our approach to integrating with any type of organization. It is the, as we have come from a consulting background, we are rooted, we are deeply rooted in understanding our customers and our clients' pain points. Um, so much so that if there is something that we do not offer at this at this point in time, then we custom build the solution for them. Um, we try to align our, our offerings with what the institution themselves hope to achieve. So we work with them collaboratively to, to develop a strategic roadmap. And we, we try, to, uh, try to serve as their key technology sponsor for their digital transformation ambitions. So some key wins for us uh, across the region, uh, starting with Zand, uh, is, uh, is, the, is the GCC's first completely digital bank. This combines both retail and SME banking into one uh, digital offering. Uh, we have also been the key technology provider for Bahrain's first digital bank, Jazil, for Kuwait Finance House. Um, we have also uh, provided the core technology and uh, digital platform for MoneyMint, which is uh, the Europe and UK's first digital Islamic bank. Um, and then to, uh, to realize uh, Dubai Islamic Bank Pakistan's ambition of providing the market the, the leading Roshan digital uh, account solution, we have provided the first uh, mobile first uh, uh, Roshan digital account offering available on the market. So uh, we, we have covered a lot of bases uh, across the uh, MENA and Asian regions, uh, as well as Europe, as you can see, uh, but we are, not, we are not necessarily limited to any particular region. Uh, there are a number of projects. If you could projects. just wrap, wrap up, uh, please, uh, maybe 30 seconds or so, because uh, the time is a bit tight. We're running out of time. Okay, there's yes. a lot to cover now. <laughs> I can share these slides. So as I said, uh, Bahrain's first digital banking offering, we, uh, we have uh, covered a lot of ground in our time here. Um, we like to, to react to the fact that the landscape is changing. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity out there in the world for, uh, for institutions and organizations that are trying to digitize, to tap into this expansive market and the deep, deep value that is available for these institutions over time. Uh, we, <laughs> I wish there was a timer to actually see how much <laughs> okay, time. No, because, oh. because it was five minutes and... and no, no, uh, I understand. So I understand. Good, good, it was, good, uh, good. Right. So uh, we try to focus on digital transformation for all of our clients and customers and partners. Uh, we, uh, we offer a range of solutions that I obviously can't get into at this point in time. Um, but 
All you need to know at the end of the day, when it comes to code-based technologies, is that we are driven to provide value, uh, sustainability, and financial inclusion for all of the organizations that we work with, no matter the landscape that they operate in. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, so now uh, let's switch then from uh, from Dubai uh, to to Abu Dhabi, uh, so which which we can do in uh, in just one second to um, to um, to uh, M2P solution. And uh, please welcome um, uh, Vaanti uh, Mohana Krishnan. I hope uh, I was right pronouncing your your name. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, very well, thank you. Um, unfortunately, Vanati is not available this evening. She's got tied up with something else, but I'm here to represent M2P and Vanati. Perfect. So the, let's go uh, straight into the, the, the pitching. So the, the floor is yours uh, for, the present, for, for the five minute presentation. So please. Thank you so much. Um, Allow me to share my screen, if that's at all possible. Perfect. It's, we can see your screen. Fantastic. Um, let me start. Uh, good evening. My name is Aparajita, and I work with M2P Solutions based in Dubai. We wish we were there to experience the event in person with you all. However, with the restrictions in travel, it wasn't meant to be. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, UAE, for giving us the time and the opportunity to represent our brand at ICT 2021. As some of you are aware, the Middle East and most, more specifically the GCC today, is one of the fastest growing fintech markets in the world, with digital adoption being one of the highest globally. As we all know, the past couple of years, and now the pandemic, has accelerated digitization of several businesses globally. The Middle East is no different. Some of the segments which have shown fast adopt adoption of digitization are banking, e-commerce, and government sector services. M2P Solutions is a fintech that was formed with a single vision to make every company a fintech. Anyone having anything to do with payments, which is all businesses essentially, should own the experience and transform into a fintech. Way back in 2015, when India was at an inflection point driven by market demand and not regulation, M2P saw a goldmine of opportunity in how a new age, state-of-the-art platform could solve pain points for businesses, both large and small, and how they could address these issues by simply leveraging our bundle of APIs. There began our fintech enablement journey, and there hasn't been a single dull moment since. 2016 saw demonetization in India, and overnight, the demand for platforms like ours, with a strong bias for speed and execution, hit the roof. The relentless and flawless execution by our teams saw the robust growth of our platform to processing over $10 billion in volume and over $150 million in transactions. And from a monoline payment enablement business, we are now a full stack player that can enable a digital bank across product lines, lending, treasury, and channels. M2P strength fundamentally has been a clear vision of our founders, Madhu, Mutu, and Prabhu. From starting off as a pure card issuance platform, the founder's vision to build a fintech ecosystem led to our easy to integrate Lego block API structure. And as banks looked towards digitizing their offerings to customers, M2P added a banking focused lending stack to their open APIs. 
With an ecosystem at play as part of the platform, we were able to harness the network effect. 2020 fulfilled our dreams of establishing international footprints by way of setting up our offices in Abu Dhabi, in the UAE, as the regional headquarters of our Middle East and Africa business. We look forward to this phase of growth fueled by international markets. Our experience and expertise in developing the market as the demand for a new wave of banking and finance dawns on the region. Thank you so much for your time. Many thanks for the, for the presentation and, and for explaining your, your product. I don't know whether one of you has a question to, to either of, of the two uh, uh, presentations, because we, we, could, uh, uh, we could technically uh, um, ask it and, and, and get the answer uh, with, with the microphone. So I don't know whether one of you has a question. So I think everything was very clear on your on both of your presentations. So I guess if if any of you here in the audience would like to liaise with uh, with either or both of you, please uh, liaise with me. I will then put you uh, uh, put you in, in in contact. So thank you for uh, for for your attention and especially uh, special thanks for for both of you for the um, for the for the presentation. Uh, so that's, that concludes our, uh, our session on, on LTIOs with, uh, with, the two, uh, with the two startups. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you, Frederick. So this was the last session of the first day of the FinTech Summit. I would like to thank, all, to thank all the speakers that took the time to prepare themselves for today and shared their expertise with the audience. I also would like to thank the ones who, who came to, who attended the event, and the ones who attended the, the event remotely too. I was really honored to present this afternoon, and also to discover insightful guests and interesting presentations. We will be back tomorrow with two very interesting half days around digital banking over the world and fintech to favor financial inclusion, a topic that is really at the core of most of the financial institutions and organizations right now. I invite you to check the program online and discover the speakers you will be able to share insights with tomorrow. So, and before I let you go, we will have a little advertising break and then...